In 2020, I was staying with my sister in her house that she'd had for nine years. I was taking a shower, and when I opened the curtain to get out, I saw the towel on the hook of the door move up and down off of the hook, like it would if you were going to take it off to dry yourself. I was shocked. I had never seen anything like that before. I ran downstairs to my nieces, ages 13 and 14, and they were just laughing. One of the first nights I moved in, I had a dream about me hiding from my sister in a boiler room or basement. I saw that she was burned up like Freddy Krueger. My sister is 40, and I'm almost certain that she practices witchcraft along with our grandmother, in whose home I also experienced weird dreams when I stayed with her a month later. We both stayed in the same room, sleeping, and one night my grandma was in my dream. When I woke up, she did too, just a minute or so later. Hours later, she got on the phone with her friend, and I heard her say, it's crazy where your spirit will travel when you're asleep. She started to talk about the exact same dream I had had. I had never told her about it. Let me start off by saying that this is a true story that happened to me when I was about 13, and I'm 27 now. Whether you believe it or not is up to you. My dad used to be a part of a small hunting club in Alabama, just a handful of guys he grew up with. Once a year, we would drive to the small town of Elba to camp for a few days and go hunting. There were a few different areas of land around the town that the club owned, and club members could go hunting there. One of these pieces of land was nicknamed the cemetery because, well, it had an old cemetery on it. Nothing really creepy about the cemetery. It was in the woods and the graves were of a slave owner and the graves of his slaves. Now, in this area of land nicknamed the cemetery, there are five or six green fields, basically a cleared out area where there are no trees, just grass and a buck hut to hunt in. A buck hut is like a tree house that you sit in to wait for deer to walk out onto the green field. This particular evening, we were going to hunt on Greenfield One, the plot directly behind the old cemetery. The evening started off normal enough. My dad parked the truck and we walked down the trail to the buck hut. We climbed up, and started to wait and watch the woods. A little bit of time passes, and my dad tells me that he's going to go for a short walk to see if maybe he can see any deer on the trail. Keep in mind, I'm about 13 years old. Not a big deal. I've hunted by myself before, and I'm not afraid of being alone in the woods. Besides, it was pretty light out. I said, okay, and he climbed down. It was just me, my 32 caliber Marlin rifle, the grass field in front of me, and the dense woods around me. This is where things started to get strange. I sat there for an eternity, or what felt like an eternity, and it was now almost twilight. My concern for my dad was growing because he was still not back yet. I was worried that maybe something had happened to him or he had gotten lost. But he's an experienced hunter, and if he was lost, he would yell or fire off a shot. But the woods had been dead silent. I figured maybe he found a good spot that he wanted to hunt the twilight and dusk hour of the day in, because that's prime time for hunting. So I focused my attention on the grass field in front of me, just watching, listening, and waiting for a deer to walk out on the field as the light of day began to fade. Just then, across the field, I saw and heard some brush moving and breaking. The thought did cross my mind that it could be my dad, but I highly doubted it. No way it could be him. That would be incredibly dangerous and stupid. I raised up my rifle, 
pulled back the hammer, aimed it at the moving brush, and patiently waited for what I hoped was a deer to walk out. Then a girl floated out of the woods and onto the grassy field. She was transparent white with a long flowing dress and long white hair. She floated from one side of the field to the other and then disappeared back into the woods. I watched her for a solid minute or two. I couldn't believe my eyes and I was petrified. Now I wanted my dad back. A short time passed and now it's pitch dark and I'm still alone. My concern for my dad was turning into panic, but I was too afraid to yell or go look for him in the pitch dark woods where I had just seen a ghost. I sat there for hours, terrified and alone in the darkness. Thankfully, he finally returned. He acted like he hadn't been gone at all. I asked him where the heck he'd gone, and he said he just went for a short walk up the trail, turned around and came back. The timeline made no sense. He was gone for hours. It was unlike him to leave me alone for that long. But he was adamant that he had only been gone for 15 to 30 minutes. We walked down the trail back to his truck, I couldn't get out of there fast enough. The whole experience still confuses me to this day. Was the ghost I saw an old slave or slave owner buried in the woods behind me? Something else entirely? Did my dad go through some time warp where time sped up? I don't know. I never went hunting there again though, and I don't plan on ever going back. My family owns a large piece of land in Missouri. It's near the highlands, but partially on the plains. It includes a lovely little chapel, a one-room schoolhouse, stables, and the plantation home. My family has owned the land for years. I grew up spending school breaks there. It was always enjoyable, regardless of the hard work I had to put in. Every Halloween, my family would do a local hayride and barbecue. It was great fun and everyone loved it. We decorated the entire property. The schoolhouse had all the original desks and materials left in it. So we tried to utilize it the most and the plantation home secondly. It wasn't super structurally sound, so we kept everybody on the first floor. Only family was allowed on the upper floors. Us cousins loved to set up and clean for the big night. The stables were a working area, so we left that to the adults. Nobody went inside the chapel because we wanted to make sure that it stayed in its original good condition. So we'd put up a fake little graveyard and that was about it. The school was abandoned and the house was a walkthrough. When I was 16, I was helping set up the walkthrough. It was cheesy, but fun. I was cleaning the ornate mirrors on the first floor when I heard laughter above me. Figuring it was my cousins, I kept working. I would hear the footsteps of them moving and their laughter for a while. When I got done, I called up that I was going to go help outside, and I heard, all right, see you later, and more laughter. I walked out smiling because I found it cute that they were so immersed in the home. Imagine my confusion then, when I walked into all four cousins at the main house. I asked them how they had beaten me back, and they looked at me like I'd finally lost it. They told me that they'd been working on the chapel graveyard, and they'd been nowhere near the walkthrough. I told them it wasn't nice to try to trick me. We left it at that and continued on for the day. I only realized we weren't alone when I got a call from my youngest cousin, asking why I was running around upstairs in the plantation home. I got deathly quiet. When she asked me again, I could only say, I'm not even on the property. I'm in town. To this day, we've never figured out who exactly lives upstairs. 
They don't cause harm, but they do enjoy their mischief. Anymore, we keep in constant contact when we're visiting, just to be sure we know who we're dealing with. Or what. A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the Park Service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy, but this one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the Park Service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and chalets, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we'd use llamas or mules to pack our gear all the while sleeping in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macaw Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves and meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal being to allow guided tours to take place sometime in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the Ozette bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain was not difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five-mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we needed on our backs. These were full 10-plus hour days, usually starting in the morning around 7 o'clock and beginning our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse around 5. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we called the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. 
It was late in the season for hikers at this point, and the weather had turned. We'd be lucky to see two to three people a day going the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around four o'clock, and my coworker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark, my rationale being that the more trips I did that day, the less I'd have to do the next. We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last of the boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun began to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun, and made visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily, having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry. I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and I've even ran into a few hillbillies over the years. Not the good kind. As I left the prairie that evening, the hair on my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted on my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I wanted to walk faster, then jog, then sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself I'd been reading too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so, before I started to hear something faint. Something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here. And I'm still at least two miles from civilization. And that civilization, in reality, was the only other soul out there, my coworker. Sure enough, though, I heard music. More specifically, a piano. It started out so faintly that I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it. The steps on the wooden boardwalk being too loud. Every time I paused, it became unmistakable, and it got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the sounds of other life. No birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush. Absolutely nothing other than the piano as if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it, but this was different somehow. Unique to this place. Unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't recognize the composition. Unsurprising, as I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow, I felt that it was meant just for me in that moment. I started walking again, almost on cue. The music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of this music. And then, as quickly as it had started, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction. It was just gone. Suddenly, everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation and weight of everything was lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life somehow was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, and I haven't since. I told my coworker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. When I told my grandfather about what happened, as he was a retired park ranger who had worked nearby at Mora, the next station over, without the least bit of hesitation, he asked, 
Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or was it just the piano this time? It seems, as I've learned and experienced since then, that there is a lot more to that place, a lot more to the Olympics in general, than anyone really knows or is willing to admit. I'm going to preface this by saying that it isn't my story, but something that happened to my parents. They live in western New York, upstate, and they're very open to all kinds of supernatural stuff. My dad has reason to believe in aliens, for reasons other than this encounter. That's a story for another day, though. It might be a good time to add that my parents do not use substances or alcohol, and they're very sharp as far as memory cognizance and intuition goes. I'm just going to copy and paste the text message that my mom sent me about this experience. I thought somebody would find it interesting, or maybe even have an explanation for them. This is what my mom had to say. Last weekend, we were coming back from Jamestown. Dad and I saw a UFO, or something, between Randolph and Steenberg. There was a huge, very bright light blinking off and on in the sky directly in front of us, and it was falling from the sky, except that it was shooting directly downward. I thought it was a falling star at first, but after it blinked repeatedly, I thought, that's not a falling star. I even thought it might be a plane, but it was too bright and too fast and it was plummeting downward with intention. Then, all of a sudden, mid-sky, it was just gone. I thought, well, it must have gone behind a hill or a mountain or the trees. Right then, I said, did you see that? And at the same time, Dad said, what the heck was that? He said that he was thinking the same thing I was. And at the same time, we both noticed out loud, there are no mountains. And there weren't. No mountains, no hills, no trees. It was just cornfields and open space. And this thing just blinked out of existence. The next thing you know, it was directly behind us, mid-sky. And it shot directly upward, back into the sky. I was looking out of my rear view, and it lit up the whole sky, like an aura all around but the brightness of it was still really bright white. Dad turned around watching it, and it started to follow us. We had that same eerie feeling that we did when we saw that thing that we thought was Bigfoot. All we kept saying was, what the heck is that? All of a sudden, it just disappeared. Isn't that weird? from California, and way back when I was on the college search, I realized that I'd likely get to the East Coast if I wanted to play field hockey. My mom and I organized a road trip through Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Rhode Island to hit a bunch of different schools in a short amount of time. One of the schools was Ithaca College. It was a last-minute decision to stop there, so we didn't have much time to explore the general area afterwards. We had been told by multiple people that the waterfalls in the area were beyond gorgeous and worth the stop, so my mom and I decided to swing by one before we left for Pennsylvania. We put Ithaca Falls in our rental car GPS, and it brought us to this red curb loop and an old, run-down overlook of the falls. This overlook was down a hill and through some trees, so my mom didn't want to leave the car on a red curb. She encouraged me to go down and check it out on my own, and I did. The first time I went down, I was sure to be observant of everything around me. I didn't want any randos in the woods sneaking up on me. I went to the ledge and took some pictures, 
sat and listened to the water for a while, and then turned to go back up. When I turned, I got this odd feeling, as if somebody was watching me or standing with me. I got uncomfortable and looked around. Nothing appeared to be wrong, so I calmly headed back up the hill. I got in the car, showed my mom the photos, and realized that I didn't take any video. My mom suggested that I go back down to get a video since we had time, so I did. The second time I go down, I feel a little less happy. I was down a slope, so my mom couldn't see me. I felt more alone and exposed than the time before, and that sinking feeling kept growing. I got to the edge, took the video with shaking hands, and now I'm feeling like I need to get out of there. I had an intense sense of urgency. I turned around to go back up, and some force stops me, dead in my tracks. I'm frozen there, like a rabbit or a deer frozen in headlights. I literally cannot get myself to move forward or take a step. An overwhelming sense of dread sweeps over my body and presses on my chest. Just such dread. I literally feel like I'm going to die. I still can't move and I sit there terrified as I feel a massive presence come up behind me. This thing felt big and so real, but I couldn't get away. I'm still stuck and helpless. I keep standing there, too scared to turn around, unable to move, when the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Whatever this thing was, it bends down toward me, and right next to my ear, it says, "You who." I kid you not, when I heard that, I ran faster than I have in my entire life. I tore up that hill, still too afraid to see what was behind me. I got in the car, slammed the door, and just like in a movie, I went, drive. My mom looks at me in disbelief and goes, is everything okay? I said, just drive. She told me later that I was pale and the sense of urgency in my voice told her that she had to get away from whatever I was scared of. What spooks me so much about this story is that I never turned around. It felt so real that it could have been a person, but I was standing right against the overlook. I don't think anybody could have snuck up behind me. And I've also gotten that sense of dread visiting other haunted places. I really feel like it was something paranormal. As for the Yuhu, it didn't sound male or female. It did sound mean though, as if it was trying to scare me or intimidate me. I've had a few paranormal experiences, but this one certainly takes the cake for the scariest. I hope all of you enjoy, and I'd love to hear your thoughts as to what you think this was. This story is real. First off, my whole life, I've been a tad perceptive. Not psychic, but just aware. I can feel energy. That feeling you get when your body tells you to run or fight. That feeling in your stomach, hundreds of knots at once. A true scare. I got that today, at work. I'd been working on a house in Palos Verdes. It's beachfront country in Southern California. We're taking down the garage to the studs. I can tell you that whatever is in this house was furious about it. Banging, knocks, catching figures out of the corner of your vision, disembodied voices, and just that feeling. There were only two of us there. I'm pretty big, so I can tear stuff down pretty easily. The guy I'm working with was wearing wireless headphones, so he couldn't really hear the things that I did. Whenever I would hear something, I would say, you didn't hear that? He would just shake his head. I don't really know the history of this house. The family living there is currently living somewhere else while we remodel. It's just day two, 
and I'm already starting to get freaked out. We started finishing up, putting all the tools away, and then I hear it. It sounded like something terrible was happening to someone. It was just a horrible scream. Even my partner heard it this time. Now do you hear it? I asked. He gave me a stern look and said, Why do you think I brought headphones? We both started to laugh nervously. I started to wonder because this is daytime. Why are they so prevalent? And if any of you were like Pix or it didn't happen, I get that. It sounds strange, but it did happen and I was really scared. I didn't want to make things worse. I was already worried that we were basically destroying the spirit's place. I think homes have memories. They remember energy. I could feel it. Look, believe what you want. I'm not here to change minds or force ideas onto you. I just wanted to tell this story. We still have a few days left on this project. I'm wondering if anybody else has had experiences like this on site. Day 2. Hey, I'm just posting this update. We came back. Last night I had nightmares about zombies eating me, so there was that. I don't know what that means, if anything, but it was horrifying and unusual. I dreaded coming to the house. We opened the locked door to access the rest of the remodel. Now, I always lock up super tight because I have a lot of tools. But when we walked in today, my stuff had been thrown everywhere. I was furious, thinking kids had gotten in and stolen my stuff. I looked around and there were two windows boarded up solid with thick plywood an inch thick, probably ten screws in each. Both were still boarded up solid. And then came the confusion, trying to figure out what was taken, but nothing was missing. It was just all thrown around on the ground. It's funny, we didn't think to take a picture until after we had cleaned it all up. Today I will keep my eyes open for more activity. I just want to get done with this as soon as possible. It all happened during November of 2017. I had just graduated and decided to sign up for the school's annual graduation trip to Johor and Singapore. At the time, my friends and I subscribed to very dumb content on YouTube, such as the 3am challenges. I can't believe I used to think that that was legit. When we arrived at the hotel at 10pm, my friends and I that were assigned to the same room decided to push through the fatigue and stay up until midnight to go explore the floor, or in other words, go ghost hunting. The hotel had already sketched me out when I saw the ancient looking lobby and had witnessed the hotel workers warning us not to use the lifts. We had to climb to the 15th floor. Before the trip, we already knew that this establishment had a dark history of side cover-ups. For example, we heard rumors of an unaliving on the 13th floor that caused a whole entire room to be sealed up. It's midnight, and my other friend and I decided to split up to explore both pathways of the current floor. We wanted to go hang out in the lobby, but unfortunately it was pitch black down there. Unsurprisingly, we saw nothing and proceeded back to our room for bedtime. At 4am I had a strong urge to pee and I was shivering so badly from the cold, so I got up to relieve myself and right when I finished up, I began to go back to sleep when I hear three clear knocks on the front door. I know this was dumb, but I opened the door without looking through the peephole. I swear that if it was somebody with malicious intent and not some kind of paranormal thing, that would have turned out pretty badly. As expected, I didn't see anybody though, so I just coerced myself back to sleep. I told myself that I was tired and I was probably still half dreaming. Turns out I was wrong. As I turned back, it started again, 
but this time I did look through the peephole because my common sense started to return. Again, nothing. I retraced my steps back to the bed and I tucked myself in while preparing mentally to just ignore the knocks. Another three knocks happened when I rested my head on the pillow. This time, I chose to not even give it a thought. The opposite happened. The knocks became louder and faster. Then they started to become bangs. It was at that moment that I knew that whatever I'd been hunting had started to play with its food. I tried waking up my friends, but to no avail. They managed to continue sleeping while I was slapping and shaking them while something was trying to get into the room. I finally gained the courage and grabbed a chair nearby. I proceeded to stand guard in front of the door. I would go on to pray while getting tormented by whatever was outside until I finally passed out at around 6 a.m. The next morning, the whole squad was asking if I had sleepwalked. I tried explaining to them what had happened, but nobody believed me. This really irritated me for like half the day until my friends from another room called us over that night to game. That night scarred me for life. This was the night that we potentially saw a real life possessed person. The teachers didn't allow us to travel between rooms to meet our friends, so we had to sneak over there. While sneaking, we saw a woman wearing a pink color baju kurong without the tudung on, on the 13th floor. We saw her when we looked down into the lobby. Her face was obscured by the floor's ceiling. She was ramming her whole body onto a random door, and she was levitating. And before we went sneaking, the class group chat had messages regarding students seeing feet floating past the bottom of their room's front doors. Before we realized that she was levitating, we thought it was just some drunk person, but soon started questioning why she would even be drinking alcohol in the first place given the culture. We started recording the situation after about three minutes of whatever that thing was banging the door, but she would burst into a sprint and dashed her way toward the lift lobby on the floor, which is a blind spot. We patiently waited until it decided to reappear. But before that, two Malay women walked past the lift lobby and headed straight to the room that the thing had been banging on. Halfway to the room, the thing in pink starts walking again instead of levitating behind them and follows them right into the room. After that, we tried running back to our room but we realized it was locked from the inside, so we spent the night over in the room we'd snuck over to. I still remember the panic that my parents had when I texted them about it. They told me to delete the footage and kept asking me if I did the room entering ritual correctly. To this day, I'm still tempted to return to that hotel, but my gut is telling me not to. Was it ghosts? Mold? Our imaginations? I guess I'll never know. My boyfriend and I went to visit family in New York, and we stayed at the Hyatt Grand Central. I believe that there's a paranormal world due to having experiences in my childhood home. I also know that Grand Central Station is known to be haunted. Our hotel was connected to the station, but I didn't think anything of it. Of course, ghosts can't travel from building to building, or so I thought. It was our last night, and I was asleep. I woke up to the sound of the hotel doorknob moving, as if somebody was trying to come in, but I never heard the door open. I closed my eyes and said to myself, you're just imagining things. I heard it again, and I looked up. When you walk into this room, there's this long walkway, and the bed is to the right. I looked up and I swear to Jesus and all of his disciples that I saw a man, a tall figure with black eyes, peek around the corner. I screamed, somebody's in here. As soon as I screamed, he disappeared and I heard the doorknob again, as if he had walked out. 
My boyfriend jumps out of bed butt naked and runs around the room. The door was locked, so I don't believe it was an actual person because hotel doors are heavy and you can usually hear when somebody opens and closes them. Of course, you can't lock the door behind yourself. I only heard the doorknob move, but never heard the door, so we figured it was a spirit. I later found out that there are tunnels from the hotel to the train station, and many people have died in the tunnels. Beautiful hotel, but I will not be returning. This happened about two years ago, nearing the end of September. My aunt and her friend decided to fly up to New York from Panama to enjoy a mini vacation with my parents and I. Although many strange and paranormal experiences have happened to me ever since I was little, this event stayed with me and affected me more than the other experiences. A lot of things have happened to my family members, especially my aunt and her friend but that's for later. So it was around 10.30 at night. Keep in mind that my old neighborhood was a very calm and quiet place. Since I live near the countryside, not much action happens in the neighborhoods. The neighbors were either elderly or young couples with smaller children, none that really caused trouble around the neighborhood. There were only about 20 to 25 houses in the entire neighborhood that I lived in. The three of us decided to stay up late and watch scary movies while my parents slept upstairs in their room. My aunt's friend was sitting near the slide doors leading to the backyard while my aunt and I were sitting in the bigger couch near the front door. I was sitting on the left side where the door faced and my aunt sat on the right side of me, which meant I was closest to the front door. We spent about 10 minutes debating on which movie we should watch. After those 10 minutes, we finally chose to watch Odd Thomas, which wasn't really a scary movie, but it was about a guy who could see spirits and demons. We were only two minutes into the movie when I had the sudden urge to look at the door. I glanced back at my aunt and her friend, only to see them staring at the door as well. I looked back at the door for about five seconds and then a loud bang came, then another one following after, and then a third. All three bangs came from the front door. It was like five people had just body slammed into the door three times. I thought it was going to fly off its frame. My first instinct was to run to the kitchen and grab a knife. But as I was about to do that, my aunt grabbed my shirt and told me to stay down. As I looked to my right, I saw my aunt's friend with her knees to her chest, rocking herself back and forth, while my aunt just kept her gaze toward the door. While all three of us kept our attention on the door, next to it there were two small rectangular windows on either side. The right window had a small curtain, and the left was being covered with a small decorative tree. The small curtain had a gap in between because it was glued onto the windows from the top area to the bottom, leaving the middle part loose. At the moment of the bangs, it caused the middle area of the curtain to puff up slowly and then quickly press against the window, leaving it wrinkled. After that, we were all silent. All of us were terrified. My aunt denied being scared, but at that moment, I could see nothing but fear in her face. I wanted to run upstairs to get my parents, but I was too afraid to go up the stairs because it was right in front of the door. All I could do was text and call them, but they were too deep in their sleep to hear the phones ring. My aunt told the two of us to calm down and dismissed it as wind. We all knew that it couldn't have been, but in order to stay calm, she made up that excuse. It was totally cliche. The next morning, I told my mother about the previous events. She brushed it off, saying that it must have been a bear or a deer, another cliche thing to say. 
We both went outside to inspect and found my mom's decorations near the front of the door thrown off to the side. There were no scratch marks or bumps on the door. Everything seemed normal, except her decorations laying to the side. When the three of us looked at the door, the night of the event, there wasn't anything that could have caught our attention. The woods were 40 meters away from the house, and we would have heard the trees moving with the wind if it was that, but we heard nothing. It was so strange how we all felt this sudden urge to look at the door at that time. It was like we all collectively knew that something was about to happen. The bangs were extremely loud and caused me to jump up from the couch. It couldn't have been kids playing a prank on us because I had been living there for about three years and nothing like that had ever happened. Plus I knew the neighbors well enough to know that they would never do such a thing. There were exactly three bangs, one after the other, and one could have honestly caused the door to fly out of place, but thank God it didn't. What about the curtain? The only explanation that we could come up with was that the impact of the bangs created the wind, causing the curtain to react that way. But why did it inflate slowly, as if the bangs were rapid, and then suddenly cause it to go against the window so fast after they were over? My aunt thinks that the wind must have been knocked off its course, and that's why we didn't hear the trees moving. And it created huge columns of wind that must have caused the doors to move so much. The gust of wind must have gotten inside the house from the cracks of the door, leading to the curtain being puffed up. Personally, it doesn't make sense, and it sounds like total BS to me. She also mentioned that she saw a shadow outside, but she doesn't have an explanation for that. I didn't see the shadow, though. My mother came up with an excuse as well. She said it must have been a deer or a bear. But why would a deer or a bear bang their head or body into a door? Like I said previously, there were no scratch marks to prove that it was an animal. No animal could have caused those three loud bangs. We've had deer sightings in that neighborhood before, but none have ever exhibited that kind of strange behavior. If anything, they run away from you back into the woods. Bears are out of the question. Not once has there ever been a sighting of them around where I am. I should also mention that we had the lights from outside on, so why would an animal come that close to a house, especially a door, that's clearly being illuminated by a light? Like I said before, the animals in this area are pretty skittish and are generally out of the question. As I mentioned, my aunt along with my mother have had many unexplained experiences and they do believe in the paranormal. I think the only reason they tried to make up an excuse for this situation was to prevent me from becoming paranoid and afraid. It's pretty late for that now though, since I've had my fair share of experiences as well. My aunt's friend has seen some things too. My aunt told me that when her friend was younger, she suffered really badly from night terrors. She said that she saw things, demonic identities as she described them. She would wake up screaming and crying. It was traumatizing for her. Her family had always been religious and they prayed for her every night and slowly those things haunting her went away as she grew up. That really creeped me out and led me to believe that she might have brought or attracted that thing to my house. Or maybe it could have been something else. Whatever it was, I hope it never happens to me again. And if you know what it was, let me know. Make of this story what you will, but it happened. Back in 2009, Ireland was going through the recession, but I still managed to buy a house. It was a nice little cottage, and it suited me perfectly as I was a single man. I did shift work, so it was nights and days, days and nights. Initially, I thought it was because I wasn't getting enough sleep, but things started to happen within the house that I couldn't explain. For instance, 
One night, I was doing some ironing. I put a towel on the railing in the bathroom and went back into the kitchen to get some more clothes to hang and put away. I came back up and the towel that I had put on the bathroom rail was strewn across the bedroom floor. My first thought was that there was somebody in the house with me, so I ran back into the kitchen and grabbed the frying pan. It was a small house, so there was really nowhere for someone to hide. After a while, I reasoned that it couldn't have been an intruder, because the door was locked and all of the windows were shut. It scared the life out of me, but I convinced myself that I just wasn't paying attention and that maybe I did leave my towel in the middle of the room, even though I knew that I didn't. But things got worse as time went on and couldn't be dismissed so easily. It got to the stage where I was actually afraid of being in my own home. For instance, coming in from a particular night at work, there was a light switch on in the hallway by the doorway. I'd have to switch that on before I'd even open the door fully. I was so terrified that I wouldn't even look into the darkness. Sometimes when I would open the door at nighttime, there would be a gust of wind coming from the house to greet me when no windows were open and there was no way for that to really happen. It eventually got to the stage where I was beginning to wonder if I was losing my mind. This went on for months things going missing, curtains being closed when I left a room, and being partially open when I came back in minutes later. The final straw was when I actually saw something. I arrived home one night at about three o'clock in the morning after being at work. I opened the hall door and switched on the light. Just to give you a picture of the layout of the house, it was quite small there was a hallway and down the end of the hallway was a doorway to a bathroom. The bathroom was out the back and the kitchen was to the left. This night in particular, I switched on the light and opened the door fully to be greeted by... All I can say is it was a big man's shadow and this thing was standing at the end of the hall. Now, how it was a shadow is beyond me because there were three spotlights running down the hall and they lit up everywhere. But this shadow stood under the light and it was facing me. Every hair on my body stood on edge. The fright and the fear and the panic was so intense. I just roared out, leave me alone. Just leave me the F alone. And with that, Whatever it was turned sideways, and I could see the whole profile of his face. There was a massive bang, and a chair was sent flying up the hallway toward me. I legged it out of the house, got back in my car, and traveled back up to my parents' house. I was so distraught. I had a brother living in our parents' house at the time, and he thought I'd been in an accident or something. I tried to explain to him as best I could what had happened. I hadn't said anything to anybody about the goings-on at the house. I'd been living there for about six months, and it had been going on all that time. Almost every day something happened. Being terrified in your own home is a horrible feeling. My brother and I drove back down to the house the following day. We found the chair that had been thrown at me in the hallway on top of the kitchen table. I had a bottle of water in the fridge and I took it out and placed it on the kitchen table. As my brother and I were talking, the bottle just burst. It was like somebody had shaken a Coke can and opened it. It just went everywhere. Every surface of the kitchen seemed to have water on it. I sold the house six months later. During the months between putting the house up for sale and eventually selling it, Strange things continued to happen within the house, like things going missing and curtains being moved. Thankfully, though, I never saw the apparition again. One night I was lying in bed. It was about one o'clock in the morning, and coming from the back of the house, I heard a woman's voice say, No doctor, please. Petrified, I jumped out of bed and turned on all the lights. I searched everywhere 
I checked that the door was locked. It was, and the windows were all shut. The television wasn't plugged in, because sometimes it turned on by itself. Same for the radio, which I also left unplugged. I'll never forget the sadness in her voice and the way she said it. It wasn't, no doctor, please help me. It was, no doctor, please help me. Like, for some reason, she couldn't trust the doctor, or she couldn't afford one. I was so glad to be out of that house when I finally sold it. When I was living there, I asked a neighbor, and he told me that the couple who I'd bought the house off of had been complaining about hearing things in the house, at least the wife had been. I don't know what I saw or heard, but I do know that whatever it was, it was definitely something that was within the house, because I've never experienced anything like that again. I don't know whether the couple who bought the house off of me experienced anything. I couldn't say. After all these years, I still don't really talk about this with people, as I don't want them to think I'm crazy. But I do know that this happened to me. In 2004, I went to Ireland on the super cheap during this one magical week where there were insanely low fares. That's not the glitch, I'm just nostalgic for that time. While visiting family there, I picked up a Ross O'Carroll Kelly book, not realizing that it was a popular series, and read The Orange Mocha Frappuccino Years in about a day. The first person narrator uses a Brett Easton Ellis-like voice, where everything is his impressions in real time. I found it hilarious. At one point, we were walking down Grafton Street in Dublin. We walked past a busker and he was playing Don't Look Back in Anger, and he was right on the So Sally Can Wait etc part as we walked by. Something about how he was singing his heart out, even though it's sort of a cheesy song, impressed me. And I turned to my partner and said, you know, I don't care what anyone else says, I love this song. And she said, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. And I was like, what? And she said, yeah, I heard another one doing it earlier. I had been with her, but I hadn't noticed. Later, in a train station newsagents, we were selecting supper. It was either a triangle sandwich each or a candy bar each. And another book in the Ross O'Carroll Kelly series, The Teenage Dirtbag Years, to read on the next train. We chose candy and the book. She'd read two pages, then I'd read two, passing it back and forth, perfect for a late evening train where half the people were sleeping and the rest were quiet. She handed me the book with an odd expression at one point, and I looked down to read. It said, So I'm walking down Grafton Street with Sorsha, and we walk past this busker, and he's doing Don't Look Back in Anger, giving it all, so Sally can wait. And I turn to Sorsha, and I say, I don't care what anyone says, that's a great song. And she says, yeah, too bad the buskers have ruined it. My own skepticism says, okay, common street, common buskers, and if you google the title of the song and busker and Grafton, there's a YouTube video of a guy playing that song in 2014. So it is a cliché. And our conversation wasn't at all original, filled with phrases that are really just filler in a way but it still felt really eerie. And honestly, it kind of still does. Back in May of 2012, my family and I went to Ireland. We were staying in a cottage in a rural area that was far away from any major city or town. Two days before we were leaving, my cousin and I and her two-year-old daughter, Maisie, were outside in the garden. Maisie had one of those interactive books for young kids that play nursery rhymes, row your boat, hickory dickory, things like that, whenever you pressed a certain button. She was messing around, pressing multiple buttons, when she pressed a green one that was supposed to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, but it didn't. Instead, 
the book played a song that neither I nor her mother recognized. Even weirder, however, was the fact that Maisie began to sing one line toward the end of the song, which I remember being something like, I will reach the Golden City to join the Angel Band. Her mother, of course, was shocked, as she was only two years old and was just beginning to talk. These words were extremely advanced for her vocabulary, even if she had only learned from memory. When I got home, I searched the lyrics Maisie had sung, and it turned out to be what I had speculated, a hymn, specifically one called The Pilgrim's Journey. None of our family was religious, and neither of us understood where Maisie had learnt the hymn, and even less why the book had played it in the first place. We tried pressing the green button again and again, but it never played the hymn again, just twinkle twinkle little star, as it was supposed to. My husband at the time and I had been married about a year when one of his friends told us that they were buying a house. Their rental house would be available and the rent was very reasonable. His wife's parents knew the owner of the house and he was fine with us moving in. We said yes, since we were happy to leave our small apartment. My husband told me that the house was pretty nice. He and his friend's band practiced there all the time. Weird stuff started happening right away. I worked and went to school during the day, while my husband was a working musician, so he was gone until very late. I woke up in bed one night, and I heard the front screen door spring squeak open. Oh, my husband's home, I thought. He put the key in the lock, opened the door, and quietly let the screen door shut. I was still in bed as I heard him walking across the living room, so I called out hello to him and told him he doesn't need to be quiet because I'm awake. He didn't answer, so I called out again. The house was quiet. I looked at my cat, who was in bed with me, and she was on high alert, sitting straight up, eyes wide, staring at the bedroom door. I don't know how long we hid out in the bedroom, but some time later, the screen opened again, and it was all louder. The door unlocked, and it was my husband this time. These events happened quite a few times, but sometimes it was just footsteps. There were often crashing sounds in the house, like a broom handle hitting the floor. Cabinet doors would be opened, and small appliances would be turned on for no good reason. We started unplugging everything when we weren't using it to avoid this. Guests, and later roommates, also experienced the same things. The house had a reputation with the neighbors, who called it Tragedy House. Once I was sitting at the table in the kitchen, and a tall black thing flew from the wall behind me on my left, through the kitchen, and out the outside wall. It happened in just a second, but I remember thinking it had to hit that wall, but it didn't, it just went straight through it. The house's owner, our landlord, told me that his wife had died while they were on vacation years earlier. She fell down some stairs, leaving him with three small children. He said that she loved this house. He would always say, I can still feel her here when I come in. You and me both, buddy. You and me both. Reading some posts about Glitch in the Matrix experiences reminded me of an experience my mom had about 10 years ago. I asked her about it again tonight, and she retold it to me to make sure I had all the right details, so I'm telling the story on her behalf. My mom was driving into the city one day and was stuck in traffic. We live in Ireland. She was looking out the window at the buildings and saw an old woman sitting in a wheelchair in the doorway of one of the buildings. She described this woman as a shawley, 
which apparently was the name of the women in this part of the city in the 1940s and 50s who worked in the marketplace. They were called shawlies because of the black shawls they wore. She remembers the woman looking out onto the road with a solemn expression, and my mom was particularly fascinated by her because it had been so many years since she had seen one of these women. The traffic moved on and she parked in a car park around the corner from the street. About an hour later, she was leaving the city and looked over to the side of the street as she was passing to see if the woman was still there. All of the buildings were run down and boarded up, including the doorway the woman had been standing in. She said that the buildings looked entirely different to how she had seen them just an hour before. My mom has always thought of this as sort of a seeing through the veil type of thing, but could it be a glitch in the matrix after all? This is a story about a house I lived in a year ago near my IT campus in the west of Ireland, which I believe was haunted. To begin, before living there, I was always pretty skeptical of haunted houses, and for good reason. As a teenager, we would often visit haunted houses in our locality, which never really proved to be so, at least while we were present there. A few days after moving into our new college house for our final year of college, my friends and I went out to do some shopping and get food. Upon arriving back, we noticed that somebody had left the oven on. Each of us denied having done it, but we knew somebody had to have left it on. Looking back though, this was probably the first unexplained incident, as thinking about it, nobody had even put food in the oven. Over the following few weeks, we started to notice odd things happening. Creaks, groans, movements from the side of our eyes. At this point, two of the housemates were convinced of a haunting, but myself and one other were not totally convinced. It was soon after that it was only me left unconvinced, as one day while the other non-believer was home doing some studies, they looked up to see a face peering at them before it vanished. It finally clicked for me when I woke up one night just before Christmas to see a very large man, or what I believed to be a man, staring at me from my wardrobe. Then things started to get really strange. Boot prints started to appear on the ceiling, making tracks across the roof by year's end. One of my friend's girlfriends swore that she saw him upstairs in the room when he'd been downstairs with me all along. Our shower, for which there are three switches needed to turn it on, would come on in the middle of the night, and one room off the kitchen would just send shivers down our spines any time we were in there. There was one night in particular that really scared me, though. I always locked my door before going to bed, and I distinctly remember doing this that night. When I awoke in the night, I could see the large man again, this time at the end of my bed. I shut my eyes, telling myself that it was just a dream, and I went back to sleep. The next morning, my door was wide open. So were all of the doors in my wardrobe, and the guys had told me that it sounded like I was dragging my school bag from one end of the room to the other, all night long. I hadn't moved anything. So many other things happened in that house, but this story has gone on long enough. I decided to tell my story after telling a Galway person about living in the estate, and without saying which house I lived in, he told me of a creepy haunted house at the back of the estate that a family he knew had moved out of a few years prior because of the activity. When I told him which number it was, he almost fell off his chair. It was the same house.
Back in April of 2011, my family and I stayed in Skyline Cabin C82, the one right beside the nature trail at Jellystone Park in Lorry, Virginia. Each of us experienced something that we believed to be paranormal, but none of us admitted it to each other until we had gotten home. As it turns out, my sister, who was eight at the time, and I, who was 11, actually saw the same figure at the same time. We don't remember the time of night, but both of us recall waking up for an unknown reason, to find a tall man standing by the bed, with his arms crossed, and an angry look on his face. At first we thought the figure was my dad, and we were confused as to why he seemed angry with us. Then we realized we could see straight through the guy to my coat hanging on the wall. I quickly rolled over to the other side of the bed in fear, as my sister slowly did the same. Later that night, my sister woke up again to see the man sitting at the dining table in the other room. She turned on her flashlight to see who it was, and the figure disappeared. My mom also woke up during the night to see a white orb fly in through the window and out through the door. As soon as the light went through the window, she heard a voice scream, You don't belong here, or you aren't welcome here, one of the two. Our stay at Cabin C-82 is something we reminisce about often, but we've always been curious if anyone else has experienced anything similar. So if you've stayed at Jellystone Park in Lori, Virginia, and experienced something paranormal, we would love to hear your story. Bonus points if it happened in Cabin C-82. I was about 15 years old when this happened. It happened in school, which was in Ireland. In my school, we had compulsory subjects that we had to take, such as math, English, etc. We were able to pick two option subjects. I chose technology, kind of like woodworking, but with circuits as well, and art. My best friend of like 12 years and I got put into the same technology class. Now, to be honest, all we ever did in that class was mess around. We never completed our projects, and instead we would just burn stuff and do stupid things. Anyway, each table was square, and one person was sat at each edge, and beside each person, connected to the desk, was a mechanical vice. It's basically something that you could tighten to hold something in place. My friend and I would literally put anything in there and just squish the crap out of it. One day, we had a piece of copper wire. It was quite thick, I'd like to say a centimeter in width, and it was probably like eight or nine centimeters long. We placed it in the vise and started twisting the knob and tightening it on the wire. When the vise fully closed, we opened it to see what would have happened to the wire. However, when we opened it, it was gone, and I mean like fully vanished. We started to look under the table, in the vice, around other tables, even behind our teacher's desk. After looking everywhere, we thought maybe we dropped it and somebody picked it up. We had like eight others in our class, so we just asked them if they had picked up a copper wire. And of course they replied, No, didn't you just squish it? Or, No, I didn't see anything. Now, I want to emphasize that my friend and I spent at least an hour looking for this wire, and we tested another wire in the vise to see if that would vanish, but instead it just fell on the floor when the vise was opened. We just laughed it off and said that it's probably some kind of interdimensional thing, but we've really been puzzled about what happened ever since. So, my partner and I have been dating for about a year and a half. This February, I was given tickets as a birthday gift to finally visit him. I live in Scotland, and he lives in Arizona. Experience number one. So I spent the middle of February over in Arizona visiting my partner. 
While we're both interested in the paranormal, I believe in it all, having had multiple experiences, whereas he tends to just humor me, not believing much of it himself. He's never mentioned anything odd happening in his apartment, but I saw, I heard, and I felt small things the first couple of days I was there. One morning in particular, at about four in the morning, I was on the sofa playing on my phone, jet lag, you know, when I looked up and saw a figure standing over him as he slept. It was similar to a shadow person phenomenon. It was just dark, humanoid shaped, but it felt nasty. When I saw it, it turned, almost as though it was startled to see somebody else in the room, never mind somebody who could also see it. It did a sort of double take and then disappeared, but the room felt off. I performed a cleansing ritual that I have come to rely on when negative energies are bothering me. For the remainder of my trip, the apartment felt light and airy, with the exception of later that day, when I was taking a nap. I felt what I thought was my partner standing over me, watching me sleep. I opened my eyes and nobody was there, but I felt that negative presence over me as though it was trying to work out who I was and why I was there. It was told in very clear terms that it was not welcome, whether I was there or not, and it cleared out. No more issues, so that was fine by me. Experience number two. My partner's friends, another couple, really helped in making me feel welcome, and the four of us went out on road trips a couple of times once to Jerome and another to a recreation spot by a lake. I felt a little funny any time we were driving around or near the reservations, as though the native spirits were very much aware of us traveling through their land. Nothing felt bad, just a sort of curiosity, but one instance in particular sticks out. While driving toward Phoenix after a day at a lake, we were all chatting away in the car when we got into reservation territory. I got the not alone feeling again, but still it was curious, though this time it was more intense. There was a lull in the conversation and I was just admiring the landscape as the sun was going down. When in the middle of the center embankment on the road, there was a figure that suddenly appeared out of nowhere. I know it was male, and I know he was a Native American. Nothing felt wrong, but when I asked if anybody else had seen him, they all said no, despite the fact that, as far as I was concerned, you couldn't miss him. He was old, tall, and completely in white, clothes and hair and everything, with an aura of hazy light around him. He simply stood, watching over the road. I don't know who he was, but it felt like he was watching over the people traveling through his land. It was comforting. I don't really know why I'm telling this story, other than the fact that I thought maybe a lighter story would be better to put with a spooky one at the beginning. In any case, I hope you enjoyed these stories, and if you've had any similar experiences in Arizona, let me know. My life was always crazy, but never did I think it was this crazy. This is my story. It was a summer day in 2011. I was 10 and my dad had gotten with his ex-girlfriend. That's a story for a different time. She had two boys. One was a year younger and the other one was older. I had a little brother as well. Now that you know the family, let me give you a little bit of background to this bone chilling story. My dad was searching for a house to rent after breaking things off with my biological mother, and he found this house, and what's crazy is that my name is Ashley, and it was off of Ashland Street. It seemed to be very cheap for the area. It was in a gated community, so of course it seemed very comfortable and safe. I mean, at least you'd think so. I moved with my dad into this house with his ex-girlfriend and her two boys, 
so there were four kids all together. We'll name them Kobe, the year younger, and Jerry, the older one, and then my little brother, Brandon. I have changed their names for privacy. It was an older house, so nothing brand new was built, but it was definitely pretty cheap. I mean, for a gated high middle-class neighborhood. We moved in. I don't remember the exact date, but it was in the summertime. I live in Vegas, so the heat is sometimes unbearable. One day it can be 99, and the next it's 104. My dad wakes me up and is really excited about moving out and just being free. My biological mother was a freeloader and a real piece of work. My dad and I picked up all our boxes and we went to the house. Now this is the first time that I was seeing it, but of course my dad did a tour with the landlord. So I went through the place picking my bedroom and all the fun things you do when you move into a brand new house. I shared a room with my baby brother, Brandon. He was like four or five at the time, so really young. I got the room I wanted, I guess out of the three I could have picked. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house, two upstairs and one downstairs. The first night wasn't anything out of the ordinary. We got Little Caesars pizza and watched Cops, my dad's favorite TV show. We went to bed and woke up like normal and went on about our day. Again, still really normal, nothing crazy. The second night was just as normal. It was about a week into living in the house when things started to happen. It was almost like the ghosts wanted to make sure we stayed or something. How sweet. So it was more like night eight and I was walking up the stairs. I was alone in the house and the stairs had carpet. I walked up them and I swear I kept hearing somebody walking behind me, but every time I would turn around, nothing would be there. I just kind of kept it to myself and told myself I was just paranoid for being at the new house by myself. I was the type of kid that was scared of the dark, and I still get scared easily to this day. I actually hate Halloween for that very reason. But these strange things just kept happening. The first spirit sighting was Kobe's birthday. He got a new spyware truck thing where you can put a camera on the toy truck and go around the house. It's kind of like a GoPro. Well, we decided to pull a prank on Jerry. So we put the camera in his room to prank him. He was asleep, so he would wake up and freak out that there was a camera. I mean, we were all under 12, so it was really funny to us, but that's not all I caught. I know the typical white woman in a white robe thing, I get it, but it was true. All we could see was a silhouette of a young woman, probably in her late 20s or early 30s, standing over him. Of course, as the two young boys were so sweet, they had me go up to check myself. So of course I went upstairs, a little spooked, but trying not to overthink it. And I went into his room. Jerry was still asleep and there was no woman in there. So I came downstairs and told myself that there's probably a glitch in the camera that just made it seem like somebody was there. So we all let it go. As some of you probably know, when you move into a house, especially an older one, the floor creaks and you might hear bumps in the night just because the furniture is settling, but only squeaks and creaks for a day or two. We kept hearing this noise, almost like somebody was walking up and down the stairs all the time. But again, we all just put it out of our heads and said that it was the house settling. Maybe something fell. No matter what, we would try to find an explanation for the situation. But over time, it just got worse. My dad had signed an 18 month lease agreement, but we only stayed there for four because this is when things got absolutely crazy. I went off to school. I was in the fifth grade. I had to repeat the second grade, hence why I was in the fifth grade at 10 years old. Anyway, my school was definitely a walkable distance, so I walked to school and back home. I got home one day and my dad's girlfriend was at work, and so was my dad. 
Kobe and Jerry were at their grandma's and Brandon was still in school, so I was all alone in the house. When I walked in, it was like something out of a horror movie. Picture this, you get home from a stressful day at school and when you open the door, it literally looks like somebody has robbed the place. The stove was on. Yes, the stove, like literal fire, was on. Of course, my immediate reaction was to call my dad and tell him what was going on. As I got into the kitchen, all the cabinet doors were open and most of the plates were on the ground, shattered. There was glass everywhere, even on the carpet. Thank God we didn't have any animals at the time. My dad, of course, got home with the cops and the cops came in and did an investigation, all to find out that there was no foul play, so there was nothing anybody could really do. So, of course, my dad's now ex-girlfriend blames me, but I told her that I didn't do it, that I came home to this. Unfortunately, my dad played right into her crap and believed her, so I was grounded for breaking her plates and causing a fire. I was so mad, but I was 10. What was I going to do, run away? I kept trying to convince my dad that I didn't do this, but pretty soon, he wouldn't need any convincing. While we were all downstairs playing and talking one day, upstairs in my parents' bedroom, there were three loud booms, all at one after the other, just boom, boom, boom. My dad and his now ex and myself all ran up the stairs to find that my parents' bed was broken. It almost looked like somebody had jumped on it really hard, and that's how it broke. The mattress was caved into the bed frame. I just looked at my dad with a cocky attitude and said, so did I do that too? My dad actually apologized to me that night, but not his girlfriend. She never liked me, but that was another story, like I said. Under the staircase, we had storage. The door to that slammed, but the AC unit was close by the door. So I just thought that maybe somebody had left it open and the wind had pushed it shut. It wasn't a very heavy door. The next night was definitely one of the scariest nights of my life. It was around 8 p.m. and we were all settling down for the night. I had school the next morning as everybody was going to bed. It was around 10 going on 11. As I was about to sit on the bed, I heard two knocks on the door. I could see a shadowy impression of feet under the door. So when I opened it, it was confusing to see nobody there. I closed it again, thinking that it had to be one of my brothers playing a mean trick on me. Again, I scare easily, so that was their thing. I heard the knocks again, and like the first time, I opened it. But nothing was there, and I didn't hear anybody run away. I went to Kobe's room. He was fast asleep. Then I went to Jerry's room, but he was still awake. He told me he didn't knock or anything, and that he'd been in his room the whole entire time, but I didn't really believe him. I had no choice to just go back to my room and try to relax. Probably about another hour went by, with nothing, no knocking or anything. But just as I had closed my eyes, I heard it again. I stood right by my door for about 10 minutes until the knocking happened again, and I immediately opened the door. Absolutely nothing. And then, in the silent darkness, I heard a giggle. I looked around the corner, and there was nothing there. Everybody was asleep, and nobody would have had time to get back to their bedroom. I just went to bed. I wanted it to be over so badly. The next morning, I tried to tell my dad what was happening, but he said I was just dreaming. I looked at him and said, so is the kitchen and the fire and the bed. That was all a dream too, right? Because we're all either having some really crazy Jumanji stuff happening or there's more to it. My dad just shrugged it all off and told me to get ready for school, so I did. Probably about another week later, I ended up staying the night at a friend's house. I'll call her Emma, just again for privacy reasons. So after school, I took the bus back to Emma's house. I decided to confide in her about what had been going on. Her mother was a medium, so I guess she could like speak to the souls that hadn't crossed over or something. Or as she would say, departed. 
When I came in close contact with her, she looked at me with fear in her eyes. It was like she knew what was going on before I even told her. She told me that I had a very negative soul attached to me. It was a female soul. And all I could think was maybe it was my dad's ex or even my biological mother. Two really horrible females. But she said that it wasn't anybody I knew closely. And that's when I started to piece everything together. The woman standing over the bed. The fire. The bed breaking. The knocking. The giggling. It somehow all made sense in some way. This spirit was stuck. But my question was, how did she get there in the first place? My dad picked me up the morning after, and I discussed with him what I had kind of put together. He said maybe the landlord would know more, so I told my dad to give him a call and tell him the pipe was loose or something so he could come over and have a conversation. You know, trick him, I guess. If he doesn't want to go into detail about it, he's definitely not going to over the phone. My dad agreed, and a few hours later the landlord arrived. My dad called me downstairs and we decided to go over everything with him, from the fire to the glass to the bed breaking to the woman standing over the bed. All the color drained from his face, and I immediately knew that he knew something. As we were all talking downstairs in the living room, there was this mirror on the wall in front of us over the television. We're sitting on the couch and as I looked up, I saw a lady wearing a very tall, almost like black witch hat, and she had very long gray hair. She just looked off, like I knew from somewhere, but didn't at the same time. Of course, I reacted very startled, and my dad told me to relax. Like, yeah, dad, let me just relax while all this stuff keeps happening. Why don't I just tell the ghost to make us a campfire as well? He didn't find it funny and sent me to my room. The landlord eventually left and fewer questions were answered. It was like he didn't want to say anything. Like our house almost blew up into flames and there was glass all over the kitchen. This isn't the time for secrets. Anyway, we looked up the address on a background search for properties and we only found two things that could have been connected to this haunting. The first thing was that the entire neighborhood had been built on a Native American burial ground, but that seemed a little cliche, so we kept digging. And then we found something even sadder. A young couple was there. They had lived there once. They had two children. One day, out of nowhere, the dad came home drunk. He shot his wife and two kids, and then set the house on fire and shot himself. Unfortunately, the house did burn to the ground and their remains were never found, so nobody knew who they were. It made total sense. The fire that started, the loud booms, the knocking. It was a sick memory that I'll never forget. I really hope that family rests in peace. At least the wife and the kids. I can't imagine being taken out like that by your own father and husband. Anyway... That was the haunted house on Ashland Street. I've never been back since we moved out, and I'll never go back again. One evening, a group of friends and I were hanging out in the city. First, we went to a local restaurant, and then we went to a liquor store to buy alcohol. As we each threw in suggestions on where to hang out, one of my friends mentioned Stowe Lake, which is a small lake in San Francisco. As we get a couple swigs of liquor in us, we start walking down a trail at about 11.45 at night. First, we stopped at a creepy gazebo in the middle of the forest, and then we began to head toward the lake. I began to power walk and try to scare my friends down the path. I see a huge tree up ahead. As I was turning, right behind the tree, I noticed a small figure start to waddle away from me. I noticed a dark blue pointy hat, a red coat, and this figure was extremely short. This sucker started running and panting into a hole in the tree. It looked a little bit like a doorway. 
I didn't really want to stick around. I played it cool as if nothing had happened and returned to my group. And, of course, I never mentioned it to anyone. But I'm pretty sure I saw a gnome at Stowe Lake. In 2013, I worked as a baker in a small cafe in central Arizona called the Wild Iris. It was a super old building and had a reputation for being haunted. I was quite skeptical at the time about all things paranormal, but also curious. I spent a week or so inquiring fellow co-workers about their experiences. I would hear stories from other bakers who would come in at 4 a.m unable to get the lights to work until the 5 a.m. barista arrived. Other stories included things like rags flying off the countertops or moving around while people turned away. Creepy, but not convincing. I remember feeling compelled to have my own experience, and I felt energetically open to inviting something paranormal to happen. During that time, I was scheduled after hours with two other co-workers to dust the air ducts. We were instructed to throw tarps over everything so that dust wouldn't dirty the workspaces. I was in the bakery, which was essentially a tiny workspace connected to the coffee area. I threw a large tarp over one of the rolling speed racks, a tall portable shelving unit. It was filled with empty squeeze bottles for caramel and chocolate sauces. Once I got to the top of my stepladder to begin dusting, I noticed a single squeeze bottle sitting on top of the tarp. There was no storage above the speed rack, so I had no idea how that bottle had managed to get on top of the tarp that I had just thrown over it. I was so baffled, and so were my co-workers. However, I wasn't convinced that it was a ghost. The next night, I was scheduled and I told everybody about my experience. Eventually, it was just me and one other coworker, the barista, closing the shop. There was only one customer left on the opposite side of the room. I think it was a young man reading by the front door. We spent all night discussing paranormal stuff and really creeping ourselves out. It got to the point where I had to stop talking about things with her because I was so unnerved by the energy we were stirring up. Shortly thereafter, I bent over to get a trash bag out of a cabinet beneath the sink when I heard a noise from behind and above me. It sounded like a woman's voice, but a combination of a growl and spoken words. It had texture to it. I have never heard anything like it before. It was like somebody speaking from another dimension, almost staticky. I immediately froze and spent a few seconds trying to logically understand what I had just heard. I knew it wasn't the song playing on the radio because it was much louder than that. I knew it wasn't my coworker behind me. But after finding no other explanation, I turned around and faced her and said, What was that noise? My coworker looked at me and said, I thought that was you. We were both frozen in disbelief. At the time, we were both equidistant from the espresso bar that had several coffee cups stacked on top. After a couple of seconds of just staring at each other, we both noticed something on the top of the espresso bar moving, and we looked at the same time. One of the cups floated a couple of inches into the air, wiggled a little bit from side to side, and then lowered itself back down. We both looked at each other to confirm what we had just seen, and then we ran to the bathroom on the side of the building, laughing hysterically, flooded with adrenaline. I was just so utterly in awe of what had just happened. I remember saying out loud something like, Okay, I get it. I believe you. Not the scariest thing ever, but to this day the most bizarre and unexplainable thing I have ever witnessed.
On May 3rd, 2017, my life was pretty similar to how it is now. I'm a bartender in a smallish beach town in Florida, so I know most people who frequent the bars in our downtown area, either as other service industry workers or patrons. I also have always lived within walking distance to work and the strip of bars and restaurants. That being said, I was 23 at the time and constantly hung out with a pretty large group of friends and co-workers and going out almost daily after work. Although this absolutely made no sense from the beginning, I thought for a while that there might be an explanation to what I experienced. If there is, I never got one. And I'm 100% sure that I do not know the person who this mystery item belonged to, but let me back up. I was going through my trunk before a camping trip one day with a guy I was dating, who lived in the apartments across the street from mine. As we're clearing things out, we find a large black duffel bag stuffed in the very back of the trunk. Upon opening it, I discovered it was full of various soccer gear. Cleats, socks, safety pads, and a jersey with a name I didn't recognize on it. I had zero recollection of anyone putting anything in my trunk. I don't have any friends who play soccer, and I never have. The name on the jersey is one that I've literally never heard of, even now and searching on social media didn't yield any results. The guy who I was dating at the time thought that I was lying and thought that it was from another guy I was hanging out with or had hung out with and dated in the past. He didn't believe me that I had no idea how it got there, who the person whose name was on the jersey was, and didn't hang out with anyone who played soccer. That drove me even more insane because I literally didn't even discover the bag in the trunk on my own previously. This was the first time I had ever seen it. I asked every person that I was around regularly as well, as well as pretty much anyone I'd seen in the past month. No one had any clue what I was talking about or recognized the name on the jersey. Please note that there are no spare keys for my car and I never let anyone drive my car. I always keep it obsessively locked and my car has never been broken into. I ended up throwing the bag away a couple of years afterwards I kept it in my trunk forever, hoping that the mystery would solve itself eventually, but no. This will forever drive me nuts. To this day, I have no idea who that person is or how that stuff got into my trunk. In the fall of August 2013, I was set to begin my first semester at Arizona State University in Tempe, and I had to attend an orientation in the middle of campus. After making the 30-minute drive earlier than anticipated, my grandma pulled into the parking lot of the First United Methodist Church where we exchanged conversation for about 15 minutes just to kill time. There was a gardener in front of us tending the flowers, and only one black sedan parked directly next to us that I hadn't noticed earlier when we pulled in. As we unceremoniously prepared to get out of the car, something caught my grandma's eye in her periphery as she reached for her seatbelt button in the direction of my passenger seat. She quickly gasped, placing her right hand on her chest as she chuckled and then quipped, wow, I thought I saw a ghost. Looking directly at her, without turning as she let out another nervous chuckle, I asked her what she was talking about. The parking lot at this point was dead silent, and the gardener was busy tending the flowers in the building opposite of the Methodist Church. Not expecting much, I slowly and nervously turned to my right, where a four-door black sedan was parked to the right of us, only to come in direct eye contact with what seemed to be a woman of Asian heritage with a bob haircut, pinstripe suit business attire, staring at us for no discernible reason. With the dead stare they were giving us, it could be assumed that they had been staring for longer than we had noticed them. What made this individual terrifying was the lack of life in their eyes. I only looked for what felt like five seconds but I could feel that glassy, uncanny valley, lights are on, but no one's home look. 
It's one like a corpse might have before their eyes were closed. The color of this entity's skin was a pale color that I could only associate again with a corpse at the time. Their mouth slowly developed into one of the most unsettling half-smiles I've ever seen as their dead eyes looked at me and my grandma, unwavering. In this deafening silence, similar to a panic attack or a fight-or-flight feeling, my grandma and I turned back to each other chuckled uncomfortably, and slowly got out of the car, refusing to look at the terrifying entity or person in the car next to us. While my grandma claims she forgot about this incident, she believes it probably did happen when I bring it up to her. If anyone can help me with identifying this type of entity, or if you've had any experience with something similar, let me know. I know that certain areas of the Tempe campus are haunted, I couldn't find any information on an incident like this, though. My mother married an older man about nine years ago, whose previous wife had died from cancer several years beforehand. We moved into his home, and I was about 13 years old at the time. I had always felt an odd feeling in this home, as my room was in the basement. Nothing out of the ordinary happened here, besides the odd being watched feeling that I would always experience in that home. My mom had hired my biological father, who I'm close to, to remodel the downstairs bathroom in my stepdad's home. My dad told me he had several of his tools moved around while he was alone working at the place. My dad finished the job and never returned. Fast forward to when my stepdad, mom, and I moved to Washington State. He and my mother began to have a lot of issues and were arguing frequently. I won't go into it, but I came to learn that my stepfather had a certain type of addiction that led him to having many women in our home that were not his wife, many of whom were professionals in this trade and were younger than his own 30-year-old children. I found this very concerning for a number of reasons, and there are some other details that, like I said, I won't go into, but let's just say it was evident that this guy had some very serious issues. He really gave me the creeps. I told my mother, and she was dismissive of it, but she gave off the vibe that I wasn't telling her anything she didn't already know. I wanted to get away from him and everything he was doing, and he bought a vacation home in western Arizona. I was 18 at the time, and I moved down there and I was living on my own. He had most of his items and furniture from his old home in this house that I was staying at alone in Arizona. A couple of weeks go by and I'm lying in my bed in my room. I heard footsteps that sounded like somebody wearing slippers scuffling along the tile floor in the living room. I was totally scared after that and I couldn't sleep. About a week after this, the hall bathroom shower was having problems so I used the master bathroom shower. I had an awful feeling that I was being watched in the master bath as well as the master bedroom and the closet. It was such a bad feeling that I no longer went into that bedroom, and I was frightened to even be on that side of the house. When I was done showering, I was near running through the bathroom and bedroom, shutting the door behind me. The same week, I was playing computer games in the office, and the desk was facing the living room. I was sitting in my chair, and I just felt like I was being watched again. I felt something touch my right shoulder. I jumped and looked behind me, but nothing was there. I was pretty spooked, but I sat back down and continued with my game. Then, maybe an hour after feeling something touch my shoulder, while still playing my game, I suddenly heard a very loud slam near the side of the house where the master bedroom is. Maybe 10 to 15 seconds after the slam, I heard several knocks along the wall on the same side of the house. I was frozen in fear. 
I stood up at my desk and all I could do was let out a scream. I called my mother hysterical and explained to her what had happened. Two days later, she drove over a thousand miles to come get me and take me back home. When I returned home, I found out that she was divorcing my stepdad, sending him to live in the house in Arizona that I had just come from. After he was gone, I didn't experience much in my mom's house, beside that feeling of being watched. I opted to stay upstairs. It was a split-level home with the living room and kitchen upstairs and my bedroom downstairs. I was upstairs in the living room when my mom's dog stood at the top of the stairs, staring downward at the base of the stairs, growling, frozen still. Soon after that, my mother sold the house and I moved out of state, and I've never experienced anything like that since. I'm still wondering if there are any explanations as to what might have occurred. I believe this might have been paranormal, and I haven't experienced anything like this since, nor had I ever experienced anything until living in the same home that my mom's ex-husband lives in. I'm 22, currently in the military, and I was an army brat until I was 12. I moved all the time, overseas twice and to 10 different states. I lived a very unusually unstable life because of this. My first life memory that I can recall, I was six. My father was stationed in Fort Sill. We lived in Lawton and this tiny brick house, very old and creepy. I recall going to take a bath before I went to bed, and I saw this odd sort of organic, amoeba-shaped, fluorescent, transparent green thing just a few feet above the bathroom tile. It floated out and disappeared. I was genuinely unconcerned and thought that I was tired. I go to bed, and in the middle of the night, this thing woke me up and had me follow it down the hallway. It leads me to the living area, where I kid you not, the whole house is full of fluorescent, transparent green people, dressed in like 1800 type clothing. I'm six at the time, so how do I even know what period clothing looks like? I couldn't tell you. I was older when I finally saw an old western movie and recognized the clothes. These people looked at me, watched me intently, and were very still. One man stood up and began walking toward me. I remember leaving and going back to bed, scared as heck and pulling the blankets over my head. Enter the rest of my life until around the time I turned 20. From this day on, every night for several years, I would have the same dream about these things. I would ignore it. I never again followed the thing if it came for me. I didn't want to know what would happen. I was an odd, quiet kid, and I guess I just accepted that it would be this way. I didn't tell my parents for a very long time. When I got used to the dreams, and the thing, I firmly believed it began manifesting itself in different ways. For instance, if I left my bedroom and shut the door behind me, the door would unlatch and pop back open, as if somebody was behind me and needed to open the door again to follow me. My father can even confirm this to this day, and he's a complete skeptic. My belongings always moved around and would be found in odd places. The lights would be on, the doors would open. It drove my parents nuts. My best friend, we'll call her T, dubbed this very masculine presence of mine, Ed. T and I have been friends for eight years now, and she definitely had to accept Ed as well. As I got older and began driving, Ed would ride in the back seat of my car. I could hear him adjust in his seat, or the occasional arm resting on the door. It sounded as if somebody was just casually riding in the back seat. Once I was driving to a nearby town at night, and I got tired. I almost veered off the road, but something shook my shoulder and woke me up. 
Maybe Ed is evil, or just incredibly protective. For example, we had a rabid dog in our neighborhood once that I encountered while on a walk. This dog, foaming at the mouth, came up to me. Once it got close, it's like he got hit hard by something. Not enough to really hurt him, but just enough to get him to go away. He ducked and kind of yelped and scampered off quickly. I could never see the source of what this was. Another occasion, I had gotten mad at Ed for moving some of my things, and while going to the fridge during dinner, my whole family watched the light fixture above my head explode and shatter. Right as I said, Ed needs to get the heck out of my life. Luckily, I was the only one hurt and I only needed two stitches. T has some interesting stories as well, as Ed didn't always want her around. Ed only got really scary whenever we moved, or really when I moved. When I packed my things, that's when it got bad. By bad, I mean whenever we were getting ready to move again, things began happening to slow down the process. When we went from Sill to Vilsack, Germany, the power in our house repeatedly went out. Two of my boxes opened and unpacked themselves onto the floor, and our house was broken into and many things were stolen. This would become a pattern every single time we started to move. On top of that, every time we arrived somewhere new, I could feel that Ed wasn't anywhere near us from about three days to two weeks. And then he would show up. It was almost as though he had to do his own traveling to catch up. For whatever reason, Ed left me in March of 2017. I lived in an old house in Montana, in downtown Helena, a very historic mining town. The house was built in 1889. It was a duplex. I rented one unit and I lived there alone for much of the time. I had a boyfriend who I dated for a long time and we lived together for some time. He knew of Ed and while he never wanted to discuss it, he was also not really bothered by it. The day we broke up, and the day he moved out and never came back, I sat in the living room crying, and I said out loud to Ed that I needed to be alone. I basically begged him to leave. I heard an odd noise. It was like a choked cry, maybe a cough or a sigh, I couldn't really place it. And then things suddenly felt empty and quiet, like I had more space. I remember never feeling this way except for those short times after a move when Ed wasn't there. That's how I knew Ed had left. Ed has never returned. It's been years now, and part of me still wonders if this terrifying thing will one day come back. I never say his name out loud. I don't bring him up, and no one that knows of him says a thing. We all just know. I lived with this thing for a long, long time. He followed me to basic training too. I often wonder what Ed was. He held power over me, preferred me to treat him in a certain way. If I ever spoke badly of him, he retaliated. Although I only did that by accident a time or two. On other occasions, he protected me. I know how crazy all of this sounds, that's why only a handful of people in my personal life ever knew about Ed. All of us still really wonder what in the world he was. In a small town in South Africa named Pilgrim's Rest, ghost stories are ever prominent amongst the locals. One school holiday, I went to visit some family who had an old gable house on the outskirts of town. Being gifted with the ability to speak with the dead, I loved going there. I would sit in the fields or near the old railway as they would show me flashbacks of the town's early days. But that holiday, something terrible was shown to me. Terrible to the point that I have never returned to the town. Not because I don't want to, but more because I'm not wanted. 
See, I discovered a dark secret of that town, and what I saw left a scar. I was out on my usual night walk through the old children's cemetery, which was established during a plague. Most of the graves remained unmarked, but all the years of death, say 1886. I loved watching the kids play under the full moon, but then I saw them, the miners. They were walking from a part of the forest that I was told was off limits, but they looked sad. They looked as if they were forgotten. The next day I went into that part of the forest, and eventually after about a two hour hike, I found the miners again. Approaching slowly, I made them aware that I could see them, and that's when they told me the story of their gruesome death. Back in those days, witchcraft and curses still scared people, and the founding families had been brainwashed into believing that the reason the plague hit the town so hard was because they were mining on sacred ground. But instead of following the right procedures to stop mining, they just decided to collapse the mine right on top of all 50 miners. They claimed that it was an accident and then proceeded to leave the miners buried under the rubble and erased from history. The Girl from Catholic School My story happened in 2013. For some context, I was staying in my grandparents' home, which was over a hundred years old in South Africa. I had experienced other unexplainable occurrences, like waking up one night to have my rosary wrapped around my neck, choking me. This event had left ligature marks around my neck. The strange part is that I had slept in a rosary for years, and I had never had anything like this happen. Other strange things that went on were doors opening on their own, the kind of doors that have handles that require twisting to open. The story I'm telling you today centers around this old house. My grandparents decided to sell it as they were both in their 70s. In 2013, I was alone at home with our housekeeper as I was studying. The real estate agent showed up to the house unannounced. I opened up for her and out stepped an older Muslim woman. With this woman were two little girls dressed in uniforms that matched the Catholic primary school I had attended many years prior. The one girl had the same fair complexion as her mother. The other girl was definitely Indian and not Arabic. I found this kind of strange, but I figured she was probably just a school friend. I welcomed them into the house and they looked around. As the agent and the guests made their way upstairs, the little girl who appeared to be Indian stared at me as her hand trailed along the banister. Then I went to go unlock the other home on the property where my uncle stayed with his family. Right behind me were the two little girls. They rushed into the house and made their way into my cousin's bedroom. The Indian girl was sitting on the bed, petting the cat who was fast asleep, and the other girl was looking around at some toys in the room. I told the girl on the bed that the cat usually doesn't really like people touching her and that she's lucky. The girl just smiled at me. Finally, the parent and the agent arrived at the flat on the property where we were, so I stepped outside to give them some space. Once they had finished, they thanked me, and the agent, the mother, and the lighter-skinned girl, who I had assumed was her daughter, had stepped outside. I paused for a moment, and eventually asked the real estate agent if she could please call the other girl to come outside so that I could lock up. The mother and the agent looked at me, puzzled. What other girl? They asked. The mom said, I only brought my daughter. I laughed at them and told them that I don't really have time to joke around because I really did need to study for my final exams. Their faces fell. I could now see that they were not kidding. I rushed into my cousin's bedroom, only to find it empty, apart from the cat still sound asleep on the bed. I tried to compose myself as I said goodbye to the real estate agent and the prospective buyer. 
After they left, I asked the housekeeper if she had seen who got out of the car. She responded that it was just two women and a little girl. I know that I did not imagine this, because I clearly saw her. She had thick black hair cut into a bob, and she had a blue Alice band. The way she smiled at me. This experience still haunts me to this day. I don't know if it was an apparition that followed the little girl from school, and maybe knew that I also attended that school. Maybe that's why she showed herself to me. I really don't know. I have never come up with a good explanation for what that was. Today I went to the same place I've been twice before. I mean exactly the same place, identical in every way. The thing is, every time I've been there, it's in a different state. The first time I was in Alabama, off Highway 10, between the state line and Mobile in 2012. The second time was off Highway 55 in Mississippi, north of Batesville in 2015. This time it was in Tennessee, off Highway 65 near Spring Hill. I have moved around a bit, and I've definitely gotten a sense of deja vu before, but that's not what this was. I mean this place is the same in every single way. The same long, curving exit off of three different highways, a left turn at a desolate three-way stop, leading to a small, single-story building on the right side of the road. The building doesn't look that old. Definitely a newer construction, but there's nothing really else around it other than trees and farmland. The lobby is the same. The furniture and its layout are the same. When brought back to an office, it feels like it wasn't really meant to be an office because there are three doors. The one we enter through and then two behind me leading to other parts of the building that I can't really see much of. Maybe a copy room and a break room or something. On the desk, there's the same pink stapler on the corner, the same garbage can that looks out of place along the wall between the two doors. The only thing that's ever different are the people. The first time in Alabama, it was a staffing company that I was interviewing with. It stood out because it felt so out of place. I had never been in that area before. I was 100% sure I was lost and about to be the main character of a true crime show. The second time, in Mississippi, it was an occupational therapist that I was sent to see because of a work-related disability. It felt very eerie, but I chalked up all the similarities to coincidence. I mean, how else do you rationalize that? Today was the third time, in Tennessee, and it was a legal office. I had an appointment with a lawyer for a consultation over some financial matters. As soon as I walked in the door, I was ready to leave. This was no longer just a coincidence. I knew I had been there before. For the third time, everything was exactly the same. Only the people were different. I have never been more uncomfortable in my life. The whole thing felt wrong in every way. I got the meeting over with as soon as possible, and I will never go back there again but who knows when I might walk into that building once more. Just somewhere else. Has anyone ever experienced this? Is it some kind of a glitch? I'd really love some answers. So this story might be a bit long, but it sure was a fun one. For me personally, anyway, as I rather enjoy these kinds of things. I come from a very religious family, and a lot of us have had paranormal encounters. My grandmother's house was haunted by someone who apparently hung themselves in the backyard many years before they even built the house. To this day, they frequently have priests come in and bless every room in the house. 
So many of my family members have been able to see things that the regular eye cannot, including me from a young age, when I used to see things in my house, which once even drove me to run into a locked door hard enough to get a concussion. That's another story for another day. Anyway, this story takes place around late October of last year. I am a student at Stellenbosch University in South Africa, so most of my friends lived in their own flats around campus, and my one friend, Bianca, had lived in a small one-person flat that was really quiet and small, basically a long hallway of a room leading onto a balcony. So we all used to hang out in her room while listening to music, playing Uno, drinking beer, and getting really stoned until early in the morning, as all good students do. We had this game that we called the Universe Game, where you basically just ask the universe a question, and she had this mega playlist of songs, so she would put it on Ultimate Shuffle, and whatever song would play after the question would be the universe's answer, whatever interpretation you took from it and worked for you. So there had been a couple of nights where we'd been hanging out, and the lights would just start to flicker in weird beats. Now, my friends didn't know at the time that I could feel these kinds of things coming, before and as they happened. So they just dismissed it as the switch just freaking out a little bit. But this kept on happening more and more each day. Until one night, we were all playing the game again, and when the answer came, the lights acted up again. This time, we looked over to the light switch and saw a faded white hand at the switch, just the hand, flicking the switch. It just disappeared, and the lights went back to normal. At this point, everyone was freaking out, but I was really just kind of excited by it. For some reason, it just didn't feel like a threatening presence. It was oddly playful to me. I kept this to myself and just played along with everyone else's reactions. So, one night a few weeks after that, my friends were all out of town, and I had a key to my friend's place. I decided I would go over there and stay for a few nights, just to hang out and draw on my favorite couch. It all went smoothly, and I was actually getting some nice work done. I had been playing the universe game a lot throughout this time, and this one night close to 3am, I was drawing and playing the game. I decided to go on to YouTube to find a random playlist to mix things up, because I don't know, I'm a rebel like that. So I find one. I ask a couple of questions and things go smoothly, and as I'm drawing, I suddenly just get a weird surge of energy through me, and at the same time the lights start going bananas. I look down at my phone, and the song playing is called Ghost. I had not smoked nearly enough to make that up, or to see that. Anyway, I jumped up and looked around to see whatever was going on, but as usual, it ended as soon as it started. I must say that this was one of the more pleasant experiences I had ever had in this line of things, and I'm not even getting into my sleep paralysis and night terrors. I've experienced a lot of strange things, but like I said, this one was actually pretty cool and I thought I would share. So when I was 20 and in the army, I was sent to my first duty station in Germany. The barracks we lived in were converted old five-story buildings that were supposedly once the headquarter buildings for the Nazi party. From what we were told, the basement of the building that I lived in had been converted into our armory. However, supposedly, it had once been filled with ovens and a gas chamber. Apparently, a lot of people died in that building. There were all kinds of underground tunnels below our caserne that had outbuildings on base, they were, of course, off-limits, but we snuck in some anyway. Aside from the underground tunnels, the building that we lived in was super creepy. I was on the very top floor, 
My friends and I would be in a room watching a movie, and doors would fling open. We all had strange experiences. I would get woken up regularly by something nudging me and calling my name. I would wake up and see figures in my room. I would hear footsteps in the attic above my room almost every night. It became normal for me. As I'm telling this story, I'm getting creeped out. Anyway, one night around two or three in the morning, I got woken up by a nudge, and I see all these lights on in the hallway from under my bedroom door. Then I hear tons of people walking in the hallway, like a crowd of people. I thought, what the heck? Are we having an alert? That's a random deployment readiness inspection that happens early in the morning. I thought maybe nobody told me. I threw on my uniform and opened the door. And it was completely dark. There wasn't a single light on and nobody was in the hallway. I thought I was going crazy. It's the weirdest thing that's happened to me. I really just stood there in shock. I had no idea what was going on. I went back to bed thinking I had completely lost my mind. I never told my friends because I thought I was losing it. I guess it can all be attributed to dreaming or sleepwalking or a half awake state. I mean, I know there's a reasonable explanation for everything, but honestly, in my heart, I know those barracks were haunted. When I was 15, I traveled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Ital, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single bedroom all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway our rooms were in, I remember almost feeling as though I walked into a wall of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway, but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. I slept the first night without any issues, other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that that wing of the hotel was odd. Later that night, I'm sleeping peacefully, when at about two o'clock in the morning, I'm awoken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about two feet toward the end of the bed by my ankles. At first, I thought somebody had broken into my room, because when I turned toward what had grabbed me, a huge looming black shape was visible in the darkness. It was like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped on the light, only for nothing to be there. The window was locked from the inside, and there was nobody in the closet or the bathroom. My room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night, scared, playing games on my DS. The next morning, we're at breakfast, and my sister mentions that she was up half the night because she thought she saw a person silhouetted against the wall of the room. But when she turned on the light, there was nobody there. It was just a bizarre and creepy experience. We checked out that day, so I never got to experience anything after that. But it still freaks me out to this day. I haven't recounted this tale in some time, so let me give you a bit of background. Between 2003 and 2005, while completing my college education, I worked the off-shift IT role at a historic federal building in Michigan that operated 24-7. This wasn't just any building. 
Dating back to the 1800s, it had served various purposes, such as a sanitarium and a hospital. The facility even had its own subterrain tunnels used for transporting supplies and, more eerily, bodies, reminiscent of train stations and old cemeteries. On my shift, I primarily worked in two areas, the call center and a secured communications room. The latter was situated in the building's sub-basement, which previously functioned as a morgue. Even though the comms room operated 24-7, with the lights always on, it perpetually felt as if unseen eyes were watching. The room's sensitive nature meant that no one could be in there alone. During the day, a minimum of three personnel occupied the room, while at night, on my shift, it was just two of us. One particular night, as I was engrossed in my homework, I heard a peculiar noise. It sounded like something heavy, being dragged on the opposite side of my cubicle wall. I beckoned my coworker, who also caught the unsettling sound. We wondered if any unscheduled work was going on, or if someone else was in our secured zone. But after checking, the answer was clear. It was just us. Every door was locked. No one had entered or left. Spooked, we took a brief break outside, for our own sanity more than anything else. Oddities were not confined to the comms room. Many reported unsettling experiences in the restrooms, like an invisible hand tugging at their clothes. But perhaps the most unnerving part of my job was navigating the vast gothic structure in the darkness while updating computers. The security guards had a habit of turning off lights in unoccupied sections, and I would invariably switch them back on during my rounds. Occasionally, as the lights flickered on, I would see fleeting shadows or hear soft murmurs emanating from seemingly nowhere. While the building bustled with life and noise during the day, masking its eerie history, nighttime was a different story. When it was just me and another colleague, every creak and whisper amplified our fears. For what it's worth, the building is still in use today. However, I've heard that many of those eerie sections are now merely storage spaces, inaccessible to most. I hope that sharing my experiences provided some insight, or at least a good story. When I was a child, around eight years old, I think I had an encounter. I say think, because after another experience I had later in life, it was highly probable. I lived in Lake Orion, Michigan then. The bedroom I slept in was not on the second floor, but it was higher up than the average. When you entered my house, you had to walk up three stairs to be on the main floor. So the windows were not ground level like ordinary homes and we also had a basement. The window next to my bed was the same height as the others. Ordinary people couldn't look into the window standing on the ground. I would like to guess that it was way over six feet off the ground. One night, I woke up facing the window. My bed was pushed up right against it. It was a reasonably small room. I opened my eyes and my eyes were looking directly at an alien. Where we lived, there wasn't any light pollution, so it was very dark outside. But the way the moon was in the sky, it must have been full or close to it. It illuminated his head, which was entirely in view, and part of his neck. He had typical features of an alien, big black eyes, white grayish skin, and a small mouth. He had his hand resting on the window, with long, thin fingers, three long and the fourth shorter. At the time, I didn't quite process his height because I was a child. I couldn't really rationalize then. But as I grew older, 
I realized it had to have been very tall. I remember being very scared. I closed my eyes again, hoping it would think I didn't see it. I rolled away from the window and lay very still. I always told myself it wasn't real. I've only told a couple of close friends about it because it always sounded silly. But as I got older, I wanted to share my story. I was little, like kindergarten starting first grade little. I lived in Germany at the time due to being an army brat. My little sister is two years younger than me, so we did everything together. We lived in a two-story farmhouse style home, and my little sister and I were playing in our room. I don't remember when he came, but we started playing with a boy a little bit older than us. I don't remember ever seeing him, just talking to him and playing games and other kids stuff. It was like he kind of just appeared. My sister and I would later realize that the little farm boy was kind of a jerk because he would turn off the lights in whatever room we were in, mostly our bedroom, and lock the doors. We would find each other in the dark, scared, but also a little bit annoyed. I remember telling my sister to try to find the light and I would get the door. They were both next to each other. I couldn't open the door, so I began to bang on it. When my sister, in a panicked voice said that she couldn't find the light. I was kind of mad scared and I thought that she was pulling my leg. And she was small, so I was like, move over, let me try. I felt around the area where I know the light switch was, but all I found was a wall. Confused, I decided to find the bottom of the wall, use both of my hands and just slide them all the way up as high as I could. Nothing. I then told my sister to do what I had just done, and I would do the same at the top. But we would do kind of a slow zigzag pattern just in case we weren't going far enough. Our hands eventually grazed each other, and we realized we couldn't find a thing. There was no light switch. So I turned back to the door, and I ordered my little sister to start banging on the door and screaming. We did this for what felt like forever. I was even more confused because mom should be making dinner right now and dad would be getting home soon or he already was. My other older sisters were never home so they weren't on my list of rescuers. My little sister and I started to give up, thinking that this was just our life now, in the dark next to the door. We weren't about to go into the abyss behind us. Then all of a sudden our mom came to the door and we shouted that we were stuck. Dad got us out, and my little sister and I were pissed. We thought they were being mean and meant to do that to us. We started saying, didn't you hear us? We were shouting and banging on the door. They looked confused and said, we never heard anything. We told them about the farm boy and that we didn't want to play with him if he kept doing that. We actually played with that boy until we left, and I'm still quite miffed about some of the things that he did. But looking back on it, I don't know. That's one heck of a prank, right? I'm starting to wonder what that boy was really up to, if he was even a little boy at all. I worked at a restaurant located in a remote town in Michigan. Do you recall that show Ghost Hunters? Well, they actually investigated our place a few years back. From what I've been told, there are two spirits here, a little girl and a man. On my first day, curious about the ghostly rumors linked to the TV show's visit, I asked a coworker about it. As she was leaving the room, she casually mentioned, Oh yeah, there's a little girl ghost here. Just as she said that, something knocked the tool we used to retrieve pizzas from the oven right to the floor. Months later, that same co-worker shared another eerie tale. 
She claimed the spirit would turn on the radio even when it was unplugged. I was skeptical, until one particular incident. It was a bustling Friday evening, with karaoke in full swing, making the restaurant quite noisy. Directly above us is an old, condemned apartment, perpetually vacant. Out of nowhere, we heard a series of thunderous steps coming from the ceiling, as if something was charging across that room. Suddenly, an entire stack of full-length hotel pans, each measuring about three feet by one foot and eight inches deep, were violently thrown off the shelf in our kitchen. The resulting clatter was deafening, like a cacophony of stainless steel crashing down onto tile floor. These pans, stacked together, must have weighed around 40 pounds. Just moments before this chaos, I had called out to the manager across the room, asking, did you hear that? About the thundering upstairs. I had this gut feeling that it was the ghost. The restaurant was loud, but the noise above was unmistakably distinct. Before he could even nod in acknowledgement, the stack of pans was flung to the floor. The most chilling part? Our 18-year-old dishwasher was directly in front of the shelf and witnessed the pans being hurled. The shock on her face was something I will never forget. In all, four of us heard the phantom footsteps, one saw the pans being thrown by nothing, and several others were startled by the clamor. Given what I've experienced, it's hard for me to remain skeptical. The only other explanation might be a very elaborate prank, but that seems even more far-fetched given the people that I work with. For context, I live in Germany. My boyfriend's childhood home is old. How old, nobody knows exactly. It might have been built around the beginning of the 20th century, but it could be older. It's a three-level house with a huge archway at the first floor that marks its age. There are two stories I want to tell you. The first one happened when we had just started dating. My boyfriend had searched for his room key for quite a while. It appeared to be lost forever. One day I entered his room and there was the key, laying perfectly placed in the middle of the bed. When he came home from work, I mentioned that I was glad he had found his key. He looked at me confused and I pointed at the door where I put the key in. He said, I never found it. Later we asked his parents and sister if they had placed it there but they denied it. To this day, we don't know how it ended up there. The second story happened pretty recently. The building has two front doors. The inner front door squeaks remarkably if you open it, so everyone knows when somebody's coming inside. My boyfriend's mother and I sat at the dinner table. His dad was watching soccer on the TV next to us on the third floor. My boyfriend and his sister were out of the house. Suddenly, my mother-in-law and I heard the front door. Then, another door-like sound. Oh, someone must have come in, my mother-in-law said. She went down the first stair and said, Hello? No answer. She decided to take a look herself. Not a single soul in sight. At the exact moment she went down to look, my boyfriend opened the door and came in, just to see the two of us confused we asked if he was mocking us. He affirmed that he hadn't even been inside before, so the door wasn't him. He and his mom both told me that these kinds of things have happened to them before. Doors open, things move, sometimes you hear steps that aren't supposed to be there. Apparently, they call their ghost Herbert, after their uncle that passed away a few years ago. I guess it's a friendly soul. Some background. 
I grew up in northern Michigan, about 30 miles southwest of Traverse City. My grandparents also lived about five minutes from where I grew up, and they have a large acreage of woods, about 117 acres. Growing up, and still to this day, they have an old golf cart, and they've created long, sprawling trails in the woods. Somewhere in the middle of the acreage is a field, about two acres, with an old sawmill. About seven years ago, when I was about 13, my sisters, nine and eight, and I decided to go on a golf cart ride through the woods on the trails. My nine-year-old sister sat up front with me, while the eight-year-old sat on the back on a mounted seat facing the opposite way. We drove up toward the field, and once we got through the trees into this area, I drove about a hundred feet in, and I saw this figure a ways ahead of me. It was probably ten feet tall, and was human-shaped. Its legs dragged as it walked, and it was hunched over, and its arms looked semi-detached and dangled. Its face was a gaping black hole, but I saw what I thought was a dangling eye. My nine-year-old sister caught it too, and it began to run toward us. I whipped the cart around and sped home. My grandpa went out with a gun to the field and found nothing. I have been able to find nothing on this for years, and my sister and I are still terrified to this day. The only legend I know of from up here is a dogman, but it wasn't that. I don't know if anybody else has seen anything or experienced something similar. Maybe it was a skinwalker or a wendigo. I really don't know. Over the years, several friends and I have experienced an odd phenomenon while traveling around the state. We live in Michigan, by the way. On multiple occasions, we have inexplicably lost hours, and we've never been able to determine why. Sometimes I was alone, and other times a friend was with me. One of the most vivid instances, from approximately seven years ago, still unnerves me. Back then, I was living in Flint, Michigan, with my parents, about a year before relocating to Grand Haven. My friend and I decided to go camping in the Beulah, Frankfurt area, a journey that typically took between three to three and a half hours. We were no strangers to this route. We had made this trip numerous times over the years, especially since my family owned a lake house on Platte Lake, and we spent every summer there during my childhood. Wanting to maximize our time, we left Flint at three in the morning, hoping to get in some early morning fly fishing upon our arrival. Roughly two-thirds of the way, on M115, just north of Cadillac, a peculiar calm enveloped the surroundings. Now, M115 runs through a national forest, so tranquility is the norm, but this calm was different. It was almost eerie. The early morning sun began to cast its first light, slowly illuminating the surroundings. Before we knew it, we were nearing the US-31 intersection in Benzonia. A glance at the car's clock showed 12 p.m., a detail my friend also observed. Doubting the car's clock, I checked my cell phone, which confirmed the time. Even a bank sign we passed displayed the same. The reality was hard to grasp. We had anticipated our arrival around 6 to 6.30 a.m., but here we were, six hours behind schedule. Fatigue wasn't to blame. I had had ample sleep the previous day, and with over 120,000 miles driven annually, I was accustomed to long hauls. Plus, both of us were well acquainted with the route. Our gas tank was still nearly full, indicating we hadn't just been driving aimlessly. Checking our credit card statements later, we found no gas charges during the missing hours. 
the truck's mileage aligned for the expected distance of our trip. What's most baffling is how seamless the time loss felt. We had no memory of any extended stops or detours. Our journey, by all accounts, felt typical in duration, but the clocks told a different story. Up until the point of 2008, I wasn't okay with the supernatural, nor did I put much stock into it. I was already socially awkward enough as it was, and I was stuck in that awful teenage phase of not like other girls, but I also didn't think that I was special enough to see ghosts, an idea that I would come to regret. I'd really be okay now if I never saw one again. For more context, after we had moved into this house during the summer of 07, my parents noted that I had undergone a significant personality change. I was suddenly nasty, aggressive, abusive to people who had never harmed me before, even to my friends. Previously, I was just a goofy kid that teachers didn't quite know how to talk to, but I was otherwise considered very bright and pleasant to be around. I was no stranger to moving every other year, and this move had barely bothered me, so they knew I wasn't just upset. It was late one night, my dad was away for work, and it was just me, my mother, my little brother, and my dog that week. For some reason, I couldn't help but feel like something was watching me. I sat up in bed to see a dark figure standing in the corner of my room, almost indiscernible at first glance. I didn't yell, I didn't panic at first, because I thought that I had to be dreaming. I wasn't special, and non-special people don't do cool things like see ghosts. I tried to fall back asleep, but it was pretty tricky, and I felt like I was being watched for the rest of the night. The next day, I asked to sleep in another room, slightly more fearful now, but thinking I just needed a change of pace. It was a fluke, and by sleeping elsewhere, my brain would reset, and I would be fine. I had not just seen a ghost. My mother thought that I was acting up for attention, but figured it wasn't the hill to die on and let me sleep elsewhere. So I did. That thing followed me. It waited at the foot of my bed all night, staring me down as I tried to sleep. I was so exhausted from the lack of sleep the previous night that I did manage to drift off, but it was a restless sleep. I tried to envision myself surrounded by white light, like the Tolkien elves, hoping that it might repel the darkness. The third day, I was sat at the table with a few friends and their mothers and my own family. We had just had dinner and were doling out the cinnamon rolls, when I suddenly felt my whole body get heavy, like somebody had just added a 50-pound weight to my skull. I couldn't stop it. I slumped forward in my chair despite my grabbing at the back of it to stay upright. My eyes just about rolled into the back of my head. Someone asked me if I was okay. I couldn't see. I couldn't see, and yet I could. I suddenly saw a flat plane stretched out before me, and everything was gray. The dark figure stood right in front of me. And then it rushed me. It ran at me so fast I didn't know what to do. I couldn't do anything. I had to fight to pry my jaws apart, and I screamed. It was like the screaming released me, and I about knocked my chair into the wall I shot back so hard. I was sobbing, and I could hardly catch my breath, while everyone tried to figure out what was wrong. I told my mother what I saw, that the thing was back and that it tried to hurt me. I think this finally convinced her that I wasn't crazy that something was wrong and I wasn't just trying to get attention. I wasn't a crier. I hated being caught crying. After I was calmed down, she took her two friends upstairs with her to my room. She didn't tell me until several years later that her friends had seen it, had seen this dark presence in my room, could prove that I wasn't lying, that I wasn't crazy. The dog often followed her around the house while she was doing chores. 
but he refused to go anywhere near my room. He actually growled at my room, hackles raised kind of a growl. Even after we moved to a new house, my dog never wanted to stay long in my room again. I don't know if it was because he remembered the bad thing from before, or if something had been irreparably broken in me, or was now a part of me. I couldn't walk into churches anymore without having sudden, unexplainable breakdowns. I would feel like hands were choking me. I would struggle to breathe. I would feel a hundred emotions at once and start sobbing. Needless to say, I quit entering churches after more than a few bad experiences. We found a journal in my room a few months before I moved out for uni, full of crazy ramblings, written by something that said it was a monster, that my parents would unalive me if they discovered I was no longer human, that it would have to hurt my family first to stay alive. I burned it immediately, and I tossed the remnants into the trash can. The scariest part of that was, all of it was in my handwriting, and yet I don't remember writing any of it. My family still wonders to this day what it was. Germany is small and so many new things got built on top of old things all the time. We lived close to Celtic tombs, had visited old mounds and tall obelisks mounted on them. We lived next to a walled city. Buildings in the village could be dated back several centuries prior and were still inhabited by people today. Maybe our home was on top of someone's grave. The weirdest coincidence of all was that the people who had lived there before us had developed a reputation of being quite nasty as well. I wonder if they'd always been that way, or if maybe the same thing that happened to me, and changed me, changed them, too. I grew up in an apartment complex for the first six years or so. It's been so long that I don't really remember it, but I know that I lived in an apartment complex near Meyer. We ended up moving into my grandmother's house with her after my grandfather passed away, and I remember some disturbances at a young age. The first time I ever had something paranormal happen was when I was helping my mom and grandma clean out my grandpa's old room, so then my mother and I could use it as our room. I was scared to be alone as a kid, so I slept in my mom's room. They had separate rooms. My grandma had converted one of the living rooms into her bedroom. One day, we were taking a break from cleaning the room. We were hanging out in my grandma's room, and I can't remember what it was exactly, Still, my mom asked me to go to my grandpa's room to grab something that she'd forgotten. It may have been a drink. As I walk toward his room, I hear the most ghostly moan I have ever heard in my life. It was almost like something out of Scooby-Doo. I ran back to my mom and grandma, and they said that I was just being silly. The typical answer that a child would always get from adults after telling a story like that. And my mom was an atheist who tried to explain and debunk everything she could. Occasionally, I would hear stuff, see shadows, and feel like someone was watching me. Still, I was never genuinely bothered by anything. My grandma would have liked to think that it was my grandpa just messing around, but I was never really sure. I just knew that things were happening that I couldn't explain, and I didn't like it. As a kid, I loved horror games. I loved watching scary movies and stuff like Ghost Hunters, which did scare me and kept me up some nights. Still, it was always interesting to me because I believed my house was haunted, but I liked to pretend that it wasn't so I could sleep at night. My mom died November 5th of 2006, and ever since that day, things got weird, and the feelings of being watched Noises and shadows increased, but nothing really significant. I thought it was because my grandma had like six cats, so they were probably just messing things up. One night in particular that I remember was when my friend came over to spend the night. 
We played video games, and he, in particular, loved to talk to me about his dreams, because they were so creative and vivid that they could have been comic books. Well, we went to sleep, and before that I closed my bedroom door, because one of the cats would always come in the room and wake us up by licking plastic for like an hour straight. Almost suddenly, out of a dead sleep, I woke up. No reason behind it, I just did. I'm drawn to look at the bedroom door as it slowly opens, and an almost pitch black cloud hovers into my room, staying close to the ceiling. As that's happening, my friend is yelling in his sleep, no, stop. At this time, not only am I scared beyond belief, but I have the strangest, most eerie feeling that I have ever felt. I was so afraid, but simultaneously so tired, that I just covered my face with my blanket. I eventually passed out and woke up the next day. Everything is seemingly normal. I asked my friend about that night, and he said he didn't see, feel, or hear anything. When I asked him about his dream, he said, I actually can't remember it. That struck me as absolutely wild, because this guy would always tell me about how cool his dreams were. I mean, he remembered all of them. There were other things I can remember. My dad one night said that he was intoxicated and opened his door to go upstairs to grab some food out of the fridge, when he said he ran into my mom as he walked out of the door, and as he stumbled back and looked, he said nobody was there. But from his face and how sobering of an experience it was, I couldn't see how he would make that up. However, all of us would occasionally hear my mom's voice calling out to us, and I would freeze and look in every direction, trying to find where it came from. Fast forward to about 2013, a year or so before I eventually moved out of the house. My grandmother's health and brain were deteriorating rapidly until she finally called 911 and went to the ER, where she was diagnosed with brain and lung cancer, almost identical to what my mom had when she passed. After what seemed to be a month, she passed away, and ever since that day, that house was not the same. It was odd before then, but after that, it went from 20 to 100, stuff being knocked over, voices echoing from the hallways and basement, loud voices, talking from other rooms when you were alone in the house, people coughing right in your ear, shadows walking down the hall, doors being slammed in the basement, the list goes on and on. I had a friend move into my house, who always told me that when he went downstairs to shower, somebody would shake the bathroom door handle while he was in there. He said that he would open it multiple times to find nobody on the other side. However, he was still trying to figure out how I was doing it, until one day he realized that I wasn't, because I had another friend come over to my house because he wanted help dyeing his hair. The friend who had his hair dyed went downstairs to take a shower, and when he came back upstairs, my buddy and I were playing video games. He walked in and said, okay, how the heck did you guys get up here so fast without making a noise. We were puzzled as heck until he told us that somebody kept shaking the door handle. My other friend went pale and told him exactly what had been happening to him. At that point, we were all pretty freaked out and left the house for a bit. He stopped coming over as much and honestly, I don't blame him. He vowed to never shower at my home again. Between hearing doors in the basement and seeing shadows, my dad kept telling me that when he was home alone, he would just hear my mom and grandma screaming his name from other parts of the house, which he says drove him back into alcoholism. If you're squeamish about animals, you might want to skip this next sentence. But one morning, I woke up to find my grandma's last cat had died shortly before we moved out. When I say the intensity of these encounters got worse, I mean it. All my friends that came over just said the house did not feel right, and they didn't feel welcome. We would always hear voices or cats meowing, 
even though by this point all of the cats had passed. I would go into my basement before work and open all of the doors, and when I would get home, I would check to find that pretty much all of the doors were closed when no one could have been in the house. This is all just my perspective. My friends, and roommate especially, have their own crazy stories that still get me to this day, no matter how many times I hear them. Ever since I've moved out and into a new apartment and now a trailer, I have experienced nothing at all, and it's been a nice change of pace. I honestly hope to never experience anything paranormal ever again. About three years ago, I went camping with my girlfriend, now ex, as she had always expressed interest but had never been. The spot we went to is in the Huron National Forest and is my go-to trail and camp spot, as it's hidden deep in the forest and the access to the trails is close and easy for ATVs and things like that. My family has been going to this spot for about six years and my friends introduced me about 10 years ago. We went on a weekend trip, and I'm glad we didn't go for any longer. When we got there, everything was going well, except we did notice a group of people hanging out next to our campsite. Still, they were just stargazing and ended up leaving, so it was weird, but not spooky at all. Then around midnight is when the weird stuff started to happen. At first, it sounded like someone was laughing at us, but the laugh never ended and got very high pitched and sounded as if it just kept going. After a while, we both got kind of scared and went into the tent to try to sleep. That's when the laugh noise moved up higher and then started to circle the campsite. After a while of that happening, it just suddenly stopped, and then it started again around 3 a.m. When it started again, the fire was going out, so I went to stoke the fire with my shotgun in hand and turned on my flashlight to see if maybe I could see any coyotes or something around the campsite, but I didn't see anything or hear any movements below. This went on until 6 a.m., when it finally stopped. And that was finally when we could get some rest. After waking up, we checked the campsite and saw nothing unusual, so we packed up. Once we were packed up and good to go, I started my vehicle, which was completely dead. That really freaked me out, as I'm always paranoid about leaving things plugged in that kill the battery and I made sure everything was closed properly and unplugged. Yet somehow, the battery still died. I got a jump from AAA. That phone call was hard to explain, and the lady who took the call didn't believe me, but in the end, we both laughed, and we did get some help. After that happened, I told my friend who had shown me the campsite, and also has a cabin in the same forest, about 25 miles away from the campsite, about what had happened, and he got really freaked out. He told me about two incidents that he's had, one at the campsite and one at his cabin. At the campsite, he stated that one night, after we'd all returned from trail riding and went to bed, he stayed up to hang out by the fire and have a few drinks. While hanging out, he was just looking off into the distance and he saw a pair of eyes up in the trees, looking directly at him. He described them as bioluminescent. He flashed his high-powered flashlight at them, but there was nothing there. And as soon as the flashlight turned off, they were looking right back at him. So he packed up and went to bed. He didn't tell us because he didn't want to scare us. At the cabin, he was hanging out with his brother, and they were both just chilling by the fire outside, when they saw a pair of eyes looking at them from a trail that led into the woods. 
They stated that at the height the eyes were looking at them, whatever it was had to be over seven feet tall. They started shooting at it with their rifles, and the eyes disappeared. But once they were done, they reappeared and were closer. At that point, they both freaked out and got back in the cabin, and they didn't leave until daylight. We have no idea what this could have been, but we all felt very scared when these events happened. After we all talked about it, one of the brothers thought that it might have been a Wendigo. I don't know what it could have been, but I haven't felt that scared before or since. Not Deer For my college screenwriting class, we were split into groups, four students each for a group project. The assignment was to select a myth or legend to base a 10-15 to 15 page screenplay on. My group thought it would be interesting to choose a cryptid for the project rather than a well-known historical myth or legend. Our teacher cleared us for the idea, and we started brainstorming. Of course, we didn't want to do the most well-known cryptids, like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot, so we started looking up some lesser-known ones. One of the ones that somebody pitched was known as the Knot Deer, in some cases the Night Deer. According to people's stories, it looked almost exactly like a large deer, but something felt horribly off. Only when they drove away did they realize what was specifically wrong about it. Still, even before they understood exactly what was going on, every story mentioned the overwhelming sense of wrongness. Quoting someone else's personal account, quote, it was a deer in the way that a graveyard is a playground. You can treat it as such, I guess, but it won't feel the same, end quote. Lo and behold, after a bit of research, I found out it was located in North Carolina. Not only that, but it was just over an hour away. Just about every written or publicized story of the Knot Deer supposedly took place in Boone, North Carolina and its surrounding areas. I informed the group of what I had discovered, and, being spontaneous as I am, told them I would be driving out to the location that very night. I figured I probably wouldn't come across anything, even though I was legitimately curious. At the very least, it was something interesting to do, and I'd be able to accurately describe the location and ambience of the area to the main screenwriter. I wasn't able to convince the other three members of my group to go with me. They all had their legitimate reasons, and since I made the decision to go so suddenly, I understood why none of them wanted to go with me on the trip. Still, I had nothing else to do that night, and I had been itching for more travel ever since the entire pandemic started. I filled my roommate in on everything and asked if he wanted to go with me. At first, he told me that he would just consider it. But as I was getting ready to go, he told me that he had decided to tag along. One of his main reasons for doing so was that he felt like he had to go with me. I shrugged it off, not thinking much of what he said. After filling up my car with some extra gas and buying a couple of snacks for the road, I plugged Boone, North Carolina into my GPS, and I headed out. My roommate and I were pretty relaxed for the majority of the ride there. We joked around, listened to all sorts of music through the radio and CD player, and had some of whatever snacks we had bought earlier. Eventually, we got close to Boone. That's when we started to feel like something was off. It wasn't a feeling strong enough to make us want to turn around, but it was worth mentioning to each other. When we got into the city, it was just about what we imagined. Gas stations, car dealerships, dollar stores, and small cafes. All of them were closed at the time, with our arrival in Boone being at around 9.10 p.m., but all of them were well lit and unintimidating. My roommate told me that we should probably head back at about 9.30, 
and that he would let me know when that time came around. I agreed with him since I didn't want to spend too long searching for an experience. Needless to say, when we didn't come across anything by 9.30, he decided to let us keep going for another half hour. The clock in my car's dash had been broken for a while now, and I couldn't look at my phone while I was driving, so I was totally reliant on him for the time. Had I known that we were going to be driving in the area past 9.30, I probably would have mentioned it and turned around sooner. Had I done that, I would have completely missed the experience we ended up having. I'm still unsure whether or not that would have been a good thing. We ended up in Tennessee by 9.50. That's when things started to get really bad. At this point, we rarely came across any other cars on the highway. We took the first exit we saw and ended up driving along more mountainous, forested roads. This meant that there were lots of tall, dark trees, almost no streetlights, and twisting roads that forced you to slow down. My roommate said he started to feel bad about the whole situation, and I agreed wholeheartedly. Still, there was nowhere to turn, so we continued going straight, since that was really the only option for the time being. A few different times, we got a serious sense of dread, but usually that feeling disappeared by the time we got onto the next section of the road. There were a couple of times that the both of us had started to tear up, not because we were sad or upset, but because it felt so wrong to be there, like it was somewhere we were not supposed to be. The feeling of dread was very particular too, it wasn't feeling bad in the sense of depression or anxiety. The best way to describe it is just that sense of wrongness. It came in waves, not sticking around for a long time, but not going away entirely either. By this point, my GPS had stopped working entirely. Both my roommate's phone and my phone said that they had full bars, but mine simply refused to connect to anything. Luckily, his GPS still worked fine, so he plugged in the directions for home. It continued taking us down that road for a while longer. The area started to become much more forested as we went on, and the road started to twist and turn much more than it had before. Basically, we had come across the exact area where you would expect a monster to be. We started to feel really, really bad. I don't think I can express the feeling well enough with words, but it was the worst we had felt so far. But we knew something wasn't right. We both felt like we just weren't supposed to be there, and we felt like we had to get out. Since my roommate started getting truly spooked, that put me on edge even more, since he never gets scared by anything. There wasn't much we could do about it, though. The GPS still wanted us to follow the road, so we both awaited its next directions, eager to get on the highway back home. The sense of dread still came and went with every other segment of road that we crossed. Eventually, the GPS wanted us to turn. My roommate told me to turn right on that road. I knew he meant to turn right onto the road and follow it straight ahead, but for some reason I figured we should just turn around and backtrack. I started slowing down, and we both started to feel the absolute worst we'd ever felt. Like things are very wrong and something was about to happen. My roommate said that my eyes were glazed over and I kept saying something along the lines of, I just need to turn around right here, over and over. The more I said it, the quieter I got until it was just, I just need to turn around right here. Keep in mind that I am normally a fairly loud person, and I had been loud the entire drive up until this point. I pulled off onto a gravel dip on the side of the road. Along the gravel dip was a thin chicken wire fence, shiny and silver. Back on the road behind us was a wall of dirt and rock. We were surrounded by tall, dark trees that blocked most of the night sky. Even with the headlights on, it was very difficult to see far ahead. He said very forcefully that we couldn't stop and we needed to keep going because he felt really bad, but I wasn't listening to him. 
I wasn't quite processing what he was saying, and for some reason I was having a difficult time hearing him at all. After he realized he wasn't getting through to me, he broke into a literal shout and told me that we had to get out of there. We could not stop, and we could not go back that way. It took him using his road rage voice to snap me out of it and get me to speed down the road. The only word I can use to describe what I felt in that moment was absolute terror. Even as I was slowing down, I felt it get worse and worse until it was almost overwhelming. I only realized that after we had gotten out of the area and back onto the highway. As we passed through the area and started getting into the city again, the looming sense of dread started to fade away. By the time we got onto the main highway, we felt safe again. But in the moment that I pulled off onto the gravel dip on the road, where I had almost stopped the car entirely, that was the most terrifying experience I've ever had in my life. I would bet my life savings that had we turned around, we would have seen something that we never wanted to. Both of us admitted to tearing up as we drove off from that spot. I was much more shaken up than my roommate was, and it took me a little while to fully process what had actually happened. I think it's safe to say that even though I didn't explicitly see anything for myself, I found exactly what I was looking for. I'm a bus driver for TransLink, Bus 169. It goes through the Riverview Hospital Complex in Coquitlam, BC. It's an abandoned mental asylum and hospital complex, with most of its buildings run down, and just a couple still in operation. It's actually the site of a lot of filming, due to how eerie some of the buildings look. I was on my last shift of the night, Always on edge, of course, because it's super eerie late at night there. Luckily, I had a couple at the back of the bus, so I wasn't exactly alone while driving through this place. As I was driving through, I saw a man sitting at the bus stop. Immediately, I was filled with dread because it was after midnight, and I doubted that somebody would randomly be waiting for a bus at this hour especially since this complex was closed off to the public at 9 p.m. every day. So, I had to do what I had to do, and I pulled over to let the man in. But the strange thing is, when I opened the door, there was no one there on the seat, and I was pretty sure I saw a person. So, I just closed the door and gunned it. I was not going outside to check. That would be a rookie mistake. Anyway, I make it the rest of the route okay, and I pull up to the last stop at the bus loop. I disengaged the locking mechanism for the back door for the couple to get out. Then I heard a guy at the back say, What the? And I turned around and I saw the back door was open, but the couple was still making their way toward the door. Our buses are equipped with a pressure-sensitive push bar that activates the door to open when pushed against it. I had disengaged the lock to allow the doors to be pushed open. I asked the couple what the problem was, but I already knew what it was before they said it. The door had opened by itself. I don't know if it was just a malfunction or what, and maybe it was a coincidence that it was the same night that I stopped the bus for a man who wasn't there. But maybe we had a ghost passenger that night. I'm not sure what to do about driving that route. I really don't want to anymore. Back in the mid-80s, we were traveling through Tennessee on our way to visit friends in Texas. My mom was driving. I, a teenager at the time, was navigating by using a paper map. These were the days before cell phones and GPS. 
We made it past Nashville on I-40 pretty late at night. We're maybe an hour outside the city. I'm charting our progress, old school with pencil and paper. We pass an exit and I mark it. A minute later, a summer thunderstorm hit. Visibility dropped to nothing. All traffic slowed to a crawl and we decided to pull off at the next possible exit and just find a motel to spend the night because there was no way we were making any significant progress in this storm. Slow, white-knuckle driving ensued. An exit loomed up on the right. No signage that we could see in the downpour, but we took it. At the top of the exit ramp, we turned right toward a brilliantly lit up gas station. The left turn was onto an overpass crossing I-40, no lights from that side of the interstate. At this point, we were on a dinky little road. To our right, there was the gas station, which we were rapidly passing. To our left and back behind some trees was what looked like a motel, but you couldn't make out the sign very well in the rain. We drove past the gas station before we realized that the road just ended up ahead. The gas station was the only building on this side of the road. It went from one and a half lane paved to one lane gravel. We could only see a short way ahead. Tire track, dirt, and grass all over the space of maybe 20 yards. Now we were past the gas station. There was only one turnoff from this road and it was on our left. We took it and tried to back up and turn around to get back to the gas station. Unfortunately, the paved slope of that narrow driveway sized turnoff led steeply down into a huge mud pit. No backing up off of it. Mom put the car into low gear, turned hard, and headed back for the gravel road through the mud. We almost made it out, but we got mired. The front passenger tire caught on the corner of an exposed concrete storm drain, maybe three feet from the road. We got out of the car and into the rain and mud, and we walked to the gas station. The place was spotless, super bright, and had two young men behind the counter. What sounded like one of Elvis's songs was playing on the radio inside. The attendant's first words on seeing us walk in were, did you get stuck in the mud? And they said it super enthusiastically, like a way too happy greeting, like a Disney staffer welcoming you as you walked into the park for the very first time, that kind of happy to see you. Also, these night shift clerks were dressed in suits that looked about 30 years out of date. The whole place was kind of creepy. We admitted we had gotten stuck, and we asked if there was a tow truck company we could call. They pulled out a phone book, again this was before cell phones or the internet, and started talking to each other. It wasn't a Nashville phone book though, some little township, a population that couldn't have been more than a hundred from the handful of white pages. But the book had dozens of yellow pages of nothing but tow truck companies. If you're unfamiliar, white pages were people and yellow pages were companies. There were literally hundreds of tow truck companies for this town too small to appear on the map. The attendants had a friendly debate about whose turn it was to come get a car out of the mud. They decided to skip over the company who was theoretically next because there had been some sort of problem with them the last time they were called out for a tow. They made a decision about who to call and let mom use their phone. More weirdness, creepiness intensifies. It was still storming, though less now. The tow truck arrived maybe five minutes later. Brilliant white, not a speck of dirt or a drop of mud on it. I have seen vehicles in a new car lot that were dirtier than this thing. Two young men in the truck were also dressed like they had just stepped out of the 1950s. Freshly polished patent leather shoes without a drop of mud on them. Starched white shirts, paper hats, bow ties. We hiked across the street and next door to the mud pit where our car was stuck. The tow truck guys were horrified. They almost got out of the mud, they said to each other repeatedly. The subtext from their shocked tone was clear. No one must ever, ever escape the mud pit on their own. These people would have to take some sort of action to make sure no one else got as close as we did to escaping. They towed our car out, easy peasy. 
We all went back to the gas station and paid the tow truck drivers for their service. The drivers let the gas station attendants know that my mom and I almost made it out of the mud on our own. The attendants were horrified and shocked by this. By now, we were getting really big Uncanny Valley vibes from all four of these men. And not just them. The whole place was too clean, too brightly lit, too strangely out of date. It was a surprisingly good facsimile of a small town rest stop populated by real humans, just in the wrong decade. Almost perfect, in fact. We were definitely in creepy town. If these guys were human, there was something seriously off about them. If they weren't, they almost had their ordinary human act down pat. The tow truck drivers went off and the attendants turned all super friendly again and asked my mom and I if we were going to stay the night in the hotel across the road. They got so excited that we might spend the night here. They talked about how great it was. Mom and I made non-committal noises and returned to the car. On our way back, I said, we are not staying here tonight. She agreed wholeheartedly. The rain is finally letting up, so we were really excited to get back out on the road. We drove straight back out onto the interstate. Didn't pass go, didn't collect $200, didn't even go near the Creepy Towns Motel parking lot. We drove down I-40 to the very next exit. It was maybe five miles. We pulled off and spent the night in a kind of crappy but refreshingly ordinary motel. At least it's not the Bates Motel, we joked. The rest of the trip went really well. Several days later, on the way home, my mom and I decided we really wanted to see this creepy town in the light of day. I mean, it couldn't have been that weird, could it? Heading back up I-40, we passed the exit where we actually did spend the night on the way down. We could see the hotel, the exit number matched the notes, everything. Then we started looking for the next exit. The exit to Creepy Town. Should have been about five miles along with an overpass. Five miles pass. No exit, no overpass. Five more miles later before we find the next exit off of I-40. It's the one I had marked as being right before the storm first hit. In short, Creepy Town doesn't exist. The exit doesn't exist. The gas station doesn't exist. I've traveled I-40 many times since, often remarking, hey, there's that non-existent exit where the weird storm hit and we went to Creepy Town. And then there's the exit where we actually did spend the night. To this day, and we've looked multiple times, we have never found Creepy Town Exit. In fact, we've never found a single exit between those two points ever again. I have no explanation. I was in Germany participating in a military exercise. Being an American, this was my first time in Europe, and also my first time in Germany. I loved being there, as I have a huge fascination with military history, especially World War II. This is important because it might have something to do with my unexplainable occurrence. We headed out to do some training. Our location was deep in the German countryside. There were some other military units out there training with us. Aside from them, any real civilization was miles away. At this particular point, we had been out for three days or so. We still had about a week to go, and we weren't expecting anything crazy to happen this early in the week. That's when we got attacked by the people who pretended to be the enemy. While most units received a direct attack, we did not. Tasked with providing communications to our artillery unit, our position was farther away. My best estimate is that we were at least two kilometers away from everybody else. To add to this, we were on top of a huge hill, so our radio signals could reach farther and be more effective. Regardless, we still needed to pull security to be safe. 
I happened to be the first one on guard shift that morning, so I grabbed our machine gun and headed out from our vehicle. As I mentioned, the hill was huge. As such, there was only one way to approach it, a tank trail. This trail went from the bottom of the hill all the way to the top where we were. The top of the hill was flat for the most part, but there was another, smaller hill to the left of the road. To get to the bottom of the small hill, you would follow the road to the top and then go about 30 meters to your left. This small hill was the perfect spot to set up a machine gun nest, so that's where I put it. Based on the position, it was impossible to come up behind me. The hill was quite steep and was covered with heavy brush and dense trees. The foliage was so thick, in fact, that the only way to approach my position was from the direction I was looking. Fast forward 30 minutes or so, and the sun is just starting to rise through the trees. It was so quiet and peaceful, and I sat on guard enjoying the beauty of Germany when it happened. I heard a very distinct, hushed voice say, Hey! Almost as if it was right next to me. It seemed like someone was trying to get my attention without making too much noise. The wind wasn't blowing. The birds weren't chirping. All I could hear was this whisper. I looked around to make sure that nobody had somehow been able to sneak up on me, but there wasn't a soul in sight. The rest of my squad was a good 100 meters away, in the vehicle, and I couldn't even hear them. It freaked me out, but I had no choice but to stay at my post. I tried to brush off the incident, but then my sergeant tried to sneak up on me a couple of hours later. I caught him, though. He hadn't realized how steep the hill was, nor how covered in brush. I heard him coming a mile away. He congratulated me for having my head on a swivel and doing the right thing. We started to talk, and that's when he told me a story that made my blood run cold. The area we were training in was a World War II battlefield. A lot of American soldiers from our sister unit had died around those parts. They'd had no artillery support, and the Germans were so well dug in they couldn't do anything about it. That information, combined with the World War II ammo cans and machine gun belts we found there, helped me put two and two together. I'm not sure what to think about this. I have no explanation for why I heard this voice. I believe in the supernatural, but I also believe in trying to find a logical explanation first. The thing is, nothing adds up. I wasn't tired, there was nobody around me, and there were no other sounds in the forest. Part of me believes that it was the spirit of a soldier from our sister troop, still fighting, hoping that I would help. But at the end of the day, the truth is, I don't know. For the past two weeks, my family and I have been traveling around various countries in Europe. Unfortunately, we had our passport stolen in Belgium and had to make a couple last minute changes to our plans, one of which included booking a hotel in a new city for one night. We stopped just for the night between trains in Cologne, Germany. I helped my parents find the last minute reservation online and it was a pretty standard apartment style rental. When we arrived at the rental, we were all impressed by the views of the nearby cathedral and church spires, the shingled roofs, just the general feel of history that the whole town had. We went out for dinner and came back after dark, all heading to bed for our early train the next morning. I shared a room with my little brother, and my parents slept in the next room over. I remember asking them if we could swap rooms, because I didn't like the layout of ours. There were way too many doors for me to feel comfortable. I have a weird thing where I don't like sleeping near doors, and I can't sleep in a room with any doors left open. Anyway, they said no, we could just stay in the original room, which had doors to the kitchen, hallway, and two closets. 
I was too tired to push it, and I figured my fatigue would override my personal habits, so I just got ready for bed and tried to go to sleep. While I was sleeping, I remember having some cycles of regular dreams. Then all of a sudden, I woke up within another dream. I was lying in the same bed, in the exact same room, and my little brother was lying in the same bed too. It felt exactly as though I had just woken up normally. Now I have very vivid dreams sometimes, but I've never dreamed about being in the exact room I'm in, and I've never woken up to a dream within a dream. In this dream, I was sitting up in bed and so was my brother. I could feel that for some reason, we were both very scared, and there was this charged and anxious feeling in the room. I remember my little brother saying, what is that? Get out your flashlight. At the same time, we were both looking at the far end of the room, where it was darker and away from the windows. It was like we were both almost too scared to speak, but I could feel that we were both sensing whatever dark energy was at the end of the room. I started to fumble for my phone flashlight, just for some light, when all of a sudden this thing, the closest I can describe it as is a dark blob of energy, moved super quickly over next to my side of the bed. My brother and I screamed at the same time as this thing rushed up next to me. That's exactly when I woke up for real, at about 2.30 in the morning. My heart was racing and I was sweating so hard, despite the room not being hot at all. I was so unsettled that I turned on all the lights in the room and I didn't sleep for about two more hours until I could finally somewhat relax and drifted back to sleep finally. This experience was very disturbing for me. I never wake up early in the morning for no reason, as I usually sleep through the night, and I rarely, if ever, have nightmares. Like I said, I have vivid dreams, but they're usually not bad. I'm wondering if anybody has ever had a phenomenon like this, or if you know what it's called. Can people have paranormal encounters in their sleep while in certain spaces? Was I just having a really vivid nightmare? Or was that experience a signal that something bad was in that room? This was back in 2006. A group of friends and I decided to spend the weekend in Germany to watch some of the World Cup games in the local town squares of Frankfurt. We flew in from the UK. Things go as expected, lots of beer and lots of fun. The evening is getting really late and we find ourselves struggling to find any more bars open at the time. We end up walking a bit and we find ourselves at the river. We decide to walk along it to see if we come across any place that's open. It's mostly just trees, grass, and small parks. It was clear that we weren't going to find anywhere here to get a drink. We rounded a corner, and all of a sudden there are these huge tents with music playing, a good amount of people, and beer being served. Great, we hit the jackpot. So we all find a table. It wasn't a waitress-style venue, more like a mini festival vibe. So I offer to go buy drinks at the bar and bring them back. The girl at the bar asks me what I'd like in German. She realizes that I am English from my terrible German and we start chatting in English. After a few exchanges, she says that she wants to introduce me to someone and to follow her behind the bar. So I follow her and we walk behind the bar and out behind the tent. It's quite a large open space, with no one else there except a group of guys in the back corner of this grassy area. She walks straight toward these guys and introduces me to them, with something along the lines of, Hey, this guy is English too. I think you'll get along. She then turns around and walks back to where we'd come from, leaving me with these guys. I say hello and we start small talking. I can't really remember what about where I'm from in England and why I'm in Germany, things like that. Turns out these guys are from the same town as where one of the friends that I'm with is from. 
I end up chatting with them for what seems like an hour or so to the point where I completely lost track of time. That's when my friend finds me. I see him walking across the grass from the tent. He says they're about ready to leave and to come on with them. I say sure, but just before we leave, let me introduce you to my new friends as they're from your town. He says hello and asks where about in the town they live. It turns out they live on the same street as one of my friend's uncles. My friend asks perchance if he knows his uncle, and the guy says, yeah, actually, it's his dad. Now both of these guys realize that they're first cousins. My original friend's dad isn't in his life anymore, and he doesn't ever have any contact with that side of the family, but obviously knows who they are. So it kind of makes sense that these guys have never met each other before, but they know who each other are once they connected the dots. Anyway, they chit chat a bit, exchange numbers, and they still keep in touch to this day. As we're walking away from the group, my friend asks me why I decided to go up to these guys in particular and strike up a conversation. So I tell him about the girl behind the bar who wanted to introduce us. That's when he looks at me really weirdly and explains that he watched me go to the bar to get drinks. According to him, it looked like I was speaking to nobody. And then I just wandered through to the back area behind the bar. It was fully open so he could see through. And I walked directly over to this group of guys and then stood there talking for that hour. My friends ended up deciding to leave me to it and just got drinks themselves until they were ready to leave. To this day, my friends do not believe me that there was any girl or third party there. To them, I just walked up to a bar, spoke to no one, and then walked up to a random group of guys in a reasonably busy beer tent away from the main area. And then one of them ended up being my friend's first cousin. Since I was making a big deal about how there was definitely somebody that introduced us, otherwise why would I hone in on a bunch of strangers and start chatting, my friend ended up calling his cousin to ask him exactly what happened. Apparently, I did just walk up to them with no one else there and start chatting. They found it a bit weird, but they just went with it. Now, I don't know if it's a glitch or what, but it's really odd especially because we're in a different country. If we were in the same town or even anywhere in the UK, it might not have been that weird and I could have explained it away, but we hadn't bumped into any other British people the entire weekend. Anyway, I've always dwelled on this and I just refuse to accept that there wasn't somebody who introduced us. I remember it vividly. And I know that being drunk doesn't help me and it makes me question my version of events too, but I remember this person. I mean, I've gone drinking a lot and I've never hallucinated before, so I honestly don't know how to explain it. Through my younger years, from about 7 to 12, my mother dated a guy very on and off, which I think mostly had to do with him being in the army and staying with his family in Laredo, Texas whenever he was home. Either way, he invited us to visit his cousin's summer cabin in Monterey, Mexico for a weekend, so we did. The cabin was very ranch style, longer in one dimension and shorter in the other so it was built like an architectural rectangle. On one far side of the building, think of this in an aerial view, was the kitchen, and next to it was the living room. Attached to the living room was a long, slender hallway connected to bedrooms on each side and a bathroom on one of the sides. The backyard was only accessible through the living room via a sliding door, and what started as a bit of the desert floor, met by a forest's tree line, although there weren't a lot of trees, mostly it was dead and dying Monterey cypress trees. Meeting the so-called tree line was an elevated hunting tower, 
its platform met the top of the vertical tree line. On our way to the cabin, my mom's boyfriend was telling us about a cursed legend of the witches of Monterey. Apparently, they had been haunting the mountainous area for generations and were his childhood version of La Girona. Clearly, he was trying to scare us from the get-go. And me being so young, I was eating it up like candy. We got to the cabin in the late evening, so we decided to stay in for the night and watch M. Night Shyamalan's The Lady in the Water. After the movie, my mom's boyfriend asked me to go get something from the bedroom for him. And as I was halfway down the hallway, he turned the lights off on me. Let me remind you that this was a very rural part of Mexico. So the dark was dark. So with all the scary stories and the, at the time for me, scary movie, I was spooked and I froze. My mom's boyfriend began to make your stereotypical ghost noises and taunted me to go deeper into the dark hallway. But I was so petrified, I remember just standing there, frozen in fear. Long story short, my mother got onto him and he turned the lights back on. They comforted me and after a few apologies, we all went to bed. I can't remember how I slept that night, but I honestly wish I did. The next day, we did basic tourist things. Went to a bazaar, embraced the city's beautiful mountain range, which seemed to hug the city, ate authentic Mexican food, and visited the main hub of the city. When the day was all done, we decided to call it and went back to the cabin. What's strange is that I remember the night before so vividly, but I can't remember much about this night other than what I'm about to share with you. I was in the living room of the cabin and I remember my mom's boyfriend was there with me. He asked if I wanted to go up into the hunting tower out back with him and I said yes. I remember following him through the back door of the living room and I remember him walking ahead and turning back to wave me toward him. I thought he was just trying to help me keep up with him, so I followed him. I watched him climb up the ladder of the hunting tower, and then I heard a voice behind me. Hey, where are you going? I turned around. It was my mom's boyfriend behind me, asking where I was going. I didn't know how to say, I was following you. I turned back around to look at the hunting tower along the tree line, and nobody was there. Nothing was. Not an animal, not my mother, not a ghost. Nothing. Fast forward to a few years ago, my now wife and I were still dating at the time and sharing ghost experiences with one another. I told her about this experience and Monterey and I'll never forget the look on her face when I told her. She is from a Mexican family as well, and this legend of the witches of Monterey is a very real thing for her as well. The scary part? I was telling her this story on a Friday, and according to what her family told her growing up, Friday is a forbidden day to talk about them because that's one day of the week that they're most powerful. Apparently, they never forget their prey, and they use that day as a lure toward what was lost. Initially, I thought, that's BS. But I can't begin to express how many Fridays my wife had to stop me because I would randomly bring up the story. Maybe it was just self-conscious, I don't know. But it still kind of freaks me out to this day. East Tennessee is known for its ghost stories and storytelling in general, as is common in Appalachian culture. The Cherokee felt connected to the region spiritually, and the Europeans that replaced them have too. 
just look up the legend of the Wampus Cat sometime. Here's my own set of stories, all in relation to Johnson City, as I am originally from that area. In college, before any of my friend group could drink, we got wild hairs and decided to go ghost bustin', as we called it. This usually involved us loading up into a vehicle and cruising through the hollows and hills of East Tennessee. We had done our research, be it on the internet or in local ghost story books, and found quite a few places to explore. The first of which I'll mention is the Exit 27 ramp off of I-26 near Irwin. Legend has it that a group of high schoolers were killed by a driver while coming off the ramp one night, many decades ago, after prom. Now their spirits watch the ramp, pushing vehicles back up the ramp and away from the bisecting road. I can personally attest to this experience. If you go at night, and there usually isn't any other traffic, you can stop your car on the bottom of the ramp and put it in neutral. Doing so will make your car roll back up the ramp. The second place is also near Irwin. It's called Bumpus Cove. From what I can remember, there were several stories about this place, including a Confederate cemetery with ghosts. We could never find it, and the GPS kept taking us to a house. Those poor people. We did, however, find a family cemetery with a paved road around it. Legend had it that if you drove around this cemetery on a full moon three times, a ghost jeep would chase you down the mountain. This cemetery was very isolated and near the Cherokee National Forest. I don't think we ever managed to do this on a full moon. We still got scared, though. Since the cemetery sat on a hill, we would see illuminated crosses poking up around the graves. Under a night sky, it's pretty horrifying, even if it's not overtly paranormal. The third story I will share is of the Job Cemetery in downtown Irwin. The cemetery is located in town, but sinks down into a creek and heavily forested area. I believe at the back end there's a large, or once was a large, railroad yard. Well, legend has it that the ghost of a murderous homeless person, who apparently was killed in a brawl in Irwin, haunts the cemetery. We explored the cemetery numerous times, but never saw much once again. It was very creepy and unsettling to go back down into the back of the cemetery, so close yet so far away from the living world. Another story we found was about an abandoned old house called Gwendolyn's House, which sits off Bristol Highway between Piney Flats and Elizabethan. This house was allegedly haunted, and tales of it can be found, or could be found when we looked years ago, on topics. I don't really know the backstory, but we went to it on several occasions and got scared out of our minds. The house sat on a one-lane road, possibly called Kuntz Road or something, and was literally falling in. Two people in our group were brave enough to check it out, but another guy and I stayed in the car. The one in the car with me was a friend who boasted about believing in ration and logic and obviously didn't believe in ghosts. Well, he ended up having a panic attack in the car and swore he was seeing an old lady in the upper story window, rocking in a chair, looking and pointing right at him. I think the most infamous ghost story of East Tennessee is the Sensabaugh Tunnel, which last I checked was closed off to the public. Much information can be found about this online, and people can tell it better than me, so it's worth reading the backstory. The tunnel is haunted by the ghost of a person who abducted and drowned a child in the creek running through the tunnel about a hundred years ago. You can hear a baby cry in the tunnel, which we believe strongly we did on numerous occasions. An omen for death, at least in those parts, is a black dog. There was also a legend that we came across of a black dog roaming the highways. Well, one night after visiting the tunnel, we were driving out of the old back road that the tunnel was on, and I almost hit a black dog. This was a narrow, one-lane road, and it sat near the Holston River. The mist was up, and I couldn't see the dog until the last second. Luckily, it didn't get hit. It must have jumped out of the way at the last moment or simply disappeared into thin air. But either way, East Tennessee 
is creepy.